Good evening, everyone. Um, it has just hit five o'clock, so we will call the special meeting of Tuesday, the 3rd of November, uh, to be open. Um, I advise that the special meeting of council will be live streamed to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording has been taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transport outside Australia. Item one on the agenda is acknowledgement to country. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that of continued importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Uh, item number two is apologies and leave of absence. I have one leave of absence, which is Councillor Moran and uh, Councillor Abraham today. Oh, it's not late yes. at all. In yes. fact, he's here. Um, so uh, I think that's in terms of apologies. Uh, the item number three is an exclusion of the public for a report uh, to be considered in confidence, which is Coring Works. Um, so if I could actually get councillor to move, thank you, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, in a second. Thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. Um, members, if not, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. So members and staff, uh, or public and staff not associated, thanks for your attendance at the meeting and the streaming will now cease while we consider this item.
questions, we'll get this underway because we've got a quorum present. Just give you a couple of moments to settle. All right, I'll declare this meeting of the committee open and I advise that this meeting will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and the recording will also be published to the internet. Uh, this means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present. I have one apology from Councillor Moran. We'll move on to three confirmation minutes. Can I have a mover and a second to confirm that they're a true and accurate record? Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Seconded, Councillor Noel. Any discussion members? All right, put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, item four, we have no presentations for us the evening, this evening, and that takes us to five, uh, five one, which is on the Hutt Street Centre. Um, and just uh, to elucidate members, usually we wouldn't have legal counsel um, appear at committee. As chair of the committee, I ask that they do appear so that we can interrogate the matter which has been placed on the public agenda. Um, anyway, so I'll pass over, we have Dr. Nick Manetta, um, uh, who's our reviewer, and Gavin Layden, who's from Norman Waterhouse, um, who is our, I guess, planning council. Um, so Mark, did you want to kick off or should I pass straight to the team? No, three. So I think it's uh, important that, um, I guess, just give you a, a broad overview of the process that was adopted in, in arriving at this outcome, and then I can't straight for questions. We'll take the report as read. Thanks, yes. Yeah. So we can just have a couple of minutes, just outline your process, methodology, how you tackle it. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, and members, thanks for the opportunity to appear tonight. Um, you've got Dr. Mineta's report. So what I was going to do is just briefly give you an overview as to the process we went through to get to this point. Um, Nick will then just summarise in a very brief way the conclusions in respect of the three questions, and then open it up for for members who may have questions arising. Um, following the uh, resolution of the Council on the 20th of May and the relevant three questions are set out in your report in the discussion, um, we were engaged initially to um, consolidate the materials and prepare a brief and engage Council to provide the independent uh, opinion that the Council had requested. In terms of the process itself, um, this arose as a result of the most recent development application for building work and operations at the centre. Our first step in the process was to view the council assessment panel meeting where that application was first considered, um, to view what was said by the objectors and uh, the applicants, the Hutt Street Centre, to review the materials associated with that development application, which were extensive, um, contained all of the representations from residents, traders, the response from the centre and so on. Um, I then liaise with council planning staff to secure what was essentially 70 years of files, historical files from the council in relation to this property. Uh, and those files were property files, building files, planning files, kept under various systems as you'd expect over the years. Um, and the main task for me was to consolidate those um, put them into some meaningful order and extract from those uh, materials that related to um, historical uses and activities, historical correspondence and historical applications. Going right back to 1954 when we didn't have planning legislation applicable to the city, where applications were principally for building work and the like. So rather than giving um, Dr Manetta um, files several feet high, um, I went through those and consolidated all of the relevant materials that went to land use and activities, uh, approvals and the like. I then consolidated that as a brief. Um, I sourced counsel and, and Dr Manetta was um, an obvious choice for me in terms of his experience having worked and managed uh, the Crown Law section um, in the uh, Crown Law Department for some time and then having gone out to, into private practice as a barrister, practising for over 25 years. I prepared the brief for him 
Um, we also were approached by solicitors acting for the traders who were interested in inspecting the council files and we made those available at our offices. So all of the materials, all of the council files relating to the historical use and activity of the site were made available and they were in fact inspected by solicitors acting for one or more of the traders in our offices. Um, throughout that process, we were then approached, or at least the council were approached um, by a number of um, agents for the traders with a request to provide further information to us that we would take into account in undertaking the review. And with a view to transparency, we said, look, we're happy to hear from you. We have viewed the CAP meeting, we have read all of your representations, but we will afford you the opportunity to uh, put whatever else you wanted to us by way of written material or oral submissions. Out of fairness, we said, however, if we're going to allow you to come and put materials to us, we will need to afford the Hutt Street Centre the same opportunity so they can hear what's said and should they wish, respond. So we organised um, effectively a, a, another de facto hearing in this room. The traders were represented by various lawyers and planning consultants. The centre were represented by their CEO, um, their lawyers and barristers and a planner as well. We set some ground rules because we didn't want it to be a, 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 a Murphy's Law. Um, each of them were afforded the opportunity to present. We gave them each 45 minutes. We allowed them to divide their time up amongst them as they saw fit. So the traders had three agents representing them, lawyers and town planning consultants, and they decided that they'd split their time 15-15-15. We then afforded the centre the opportunity to respond. They um, took a similar amount of time. They responded and put their position uh, throughout that process, they also handed up various documents and whatnot, many of which we had seen already from the extensive council files that Nick and I had reviewed. Um, that hearing went well. It was um, uh, very well ordered. Everyone was well behaved, uh, very convivial, and I think everyone um, appreciated the opportunity to further put their case. Um, following that, a week or so later, um, staff were again approached with some further materials from the traders. And we said, look, we will accept those, but there needs to be an end to the process. We can't keep going on with this indefinitely. We accepted those materials. Again, they raised matters relating to antisocial behaviour that we had read before. They were historical uh, statutory declarations and the like from previous interviews and whatnot. We took them into account. Um, they were all passed on. And as a result of that, a draft opinion was, was, was prepared. Um, we briefed um, senior council staff that was finalised and that then is the opinion that you have before you as part of the, the report tonight. Essentially, three questions were asked in the um, motion that was passed. We were asked to firstly review the current and historical approvals to ascertain as best we could whether the current activities fell within the existing use rights and or subsequent development authorisations that have been granted. We were then asked to consider whether an increase in the intensity of the use or the demand for the services was itself a change of use or whether that in some way might have cancelled the existing use rights that applied. And then finally, um, what uh, responsibility fell to the council in the event that the activities were beyond any relevant existing land use rights or relevant approvals uh, or conditions attaching to those approvals. So th those were the three questions. I'll hand over to uh, Dr Mineta just to, in a summary form, give you a, a conclusion to each of those three questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I put myself on the speak. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the Council and thank you very much for your instructions. Um, it was certainly an interesting exercise and an important exercise, I assume, for the Council and for the rate players insofar as this, uh, the activities in the Hutt Street Centre have proved to be um, difficult, and I only say difficult in the sense of uh, ar um, arousing legitimate concerns around uh, antisocial activity, not within the centre itself, of course, but outside the centre. That's the, the catalyst. Um, I was vetted, if I can use that expression, I have no connection with uh, any of the operators of the Hutt Street Centre and, um, and no connection at all with any of the the traders and I wish to say that expressly so that you can rest assured that I've given this a completely independent uh, view 
Um, I'm clear in my view based on the historical materials that have been provided to me. The three questions have been outlined by Gavin. I, I hear what um, was said earlier about uh, the report having been read. I, um, I've tried to keep it as straightforward as possible, but it does Travis some change in legislative regime um, over the decades. But it is quite clear that in, uh, there is no, in my opinion, uh, unauthorised use on that site. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been a change of activities over the years. There's a clear difference in planning law between a change of activity and a change of use of the land. So I wasn't asked to identify changes of activity as such. That would always be a pointless exercise. What I was asked to do was to look at the uh, any unauthorised land use. Uh, and it's clear, in my opinion, um, that this centre has operated effectively as a form of community welfare centre, for want of a different term, labels are always dangerous, for some considerable time. It may be of interest to the Council that uh, in 1994 in particular, um, the very same concerns that were have been raised by people in the community were raised back then. Um, it's striking, in fact, how many of the complaints are um, have repeated themselves, so to speak. Um, so the issues are certainly not new, and I'm sure the council appreciates that. Uh, but it's quite clear that the centre is operating lawfully from a planning law perspective. There's been no change of use uh, on, on the land that I can identify from the documentation, very comprehensive documentation uh, that was provided to me. And I might take this opportunity to thank Gavin for all his work and his firm's work in providing such an excellent a brief. I have every confidence that I can give it all appropriate information. Um, there has been very real concerns raised by uh, some members of the community concerning the intensity of that land use, that there is presently a growing demand for services uh, and that, and as, as was the case in 1994, there's a fear that a new facility will only add to demand and somehow be attractive. And that's become something, I suppose, of a lightning rod for uh, perhaps commute, some community concern. Um, it's quite clear that this has been a public service provider, that is the Hutt Street Centre, for some considerable time, some decades now. And the increase in demand is not welcomed, I might say, by the Hutt Street Centre, of course, for obvious reasons. I wish to alleviate poverty, not encourage it. But at the end of the day, um, it's quite clear that an increase in demand is not going, and an increase in the provision of the service does not constitute in law a change of use. Uh, that's true of all the shops around Adelaide. And so if, if a planning authority is concerned about um, intensity of use, then conditions, uh, the use of conditions is the appropriate way to ensure that the use remains within what I perceive to be reasonable bounds. Um, so that's really the answer to A and C, to A and C. Um, and the third question is really the impact of the land use on surrounding businesses and residents and council's responsibility in that, that uh, in regulating that impact. Can I say that um, I, I took at face value the complaints of the uh, community that were uh, received. I uh, did not, of course, given my instructions to be at arm's length, interrogate them, so to speak, or seek to verify them in some way, but I have no reason to doubt the sincerity of the vast majority of those complaints. They were self-evidently reasonable, often very often balanced. Um, in that they were written by people who acknowledge the uh, fine work that has been done by the centre. So I just took them on balance. Um, uh, I sort of took them at face value. Um, I didn't uh, downplay them or depreciate them in any way and I had no, no basis for so doing. Um, the answer though is that really uh, if there's antisocial uh, behaviour in any part of the city in a public place then Really, uh, fairly and squarely, that becomes a police responsibility. The council is, of course, responsible for enforcing planning law uh, laws and, in particular, for enforcing conditions of operation which uh, do not exist, I think, in relation to the centre, so far as I can, I can tell or ascertain. Um, and so um, it really becomes a matter of policing. Um, now, there does seem to be, and I offer this observation simply from outside, so to speak, the legal square that I've been operating in, there does seem, appear to be a disconnect between uh, the community's perception of antisocial behaviour and the increase and what the police say is happening there as a matter of statistical evidence. 
um, the police has suggest, suggest uh, that uh, have suggested in various fora that uh, there is no um, undue increase in antisocial behaviour when they analyse it statistically. I imagine that's not accepted by the community there. Uh, it may be that a lot of events are simply no longer being reported. Of course, I simply offer that as a common sense ob observation. But so far as the council is concerned, um, I don't think the council really can do much about uh, policing uh, antisocial behaviour in public places, nor can the staff of the Hutt Street. I think that's important. Once they, they are responsible certainly for what goes on in their precinct, um, but they can't. Once someone leaves the, the gate, the front gate, they're in the public street, they don't really have any further role to play or any greater role than anyone around this table. Uh, and indeed, to expect employees of the Hutt Street Centre to be out there somehow regulating behaviour may in itself throw up occupational health and safety issues. What are they to do with uh, antisocial behaviour or violent behaviour or threats and so on? But uh, that's perhaps a little bit by the by. Um, they are certainly not responsible for what goes on um, in, the, in the street. And uh, I noticed that a working party in 1994 was suggested. I think the meeting was held, in fact, in this very room, as was the forum that Gavin and I attended um, some 26 years later. Uh, I don't know what happened with that working party, but it was a suggestion at the time. Um, whether it does or doesn't recommend itself to the council now as a, a way to bring the parties together to move forward, I, I leave to the council. Um, happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Manetta. Members? Robert? Thanks, Chair, and thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation. Um, my questions are actually more for uh, a council um, administration around some of the costs associated with the project. Is it okay for me to direct those through to you, Mark? You may be the best person. <laughs> through me and Brett's been the one that's been handling the project. Sure. All right. Um, so the um, cost of the legal review that's included in the papers is $41,086. There were some media reports that the figure was around $30,000. Can I clarify whether it's the $40,000 or $30,000? Through the chair, I can confirm that the, the total file cost to date at the time of writing that report is as printed in the report, which is the, the $41,000 figure, not the uh, $30,000 figure. Um, that um, may have come about due to my initial drafting um, prior to publication, not reflecting the, the final cost attribution when I first um, initially put the draft into the reporting system, and I didn't come to finalising that and getting the updated information until closer to the agenda time. So there would have been that disparity in the time of me drafting it and having the draft sitting in the reporting system and finalising that and having the final cost figures. And ultimately, there will be some further very minor cost for the presence today that hasn't been um, attributed in that figure. Sure. Does um, that cost attribution include the um, time of council staff uh, in working on the project? And through the chair, no, that cost does not um, include the administrative time and effort um, in coordinating um, and engaging Waterhouse lawyers, obtaining the files through central records and uh, facilitating the, the de facto hearing essentially. So how many staff have been involved in that project? Uh, through the chair, the only staff involved in the project have been Rudy Coe and myself. Okay. And are you able to give an estimate of the uh, number of hours that have been spent on the project? Through the chair, I haven't uh, calculated a cost estimate um, with Rudy Deco. I wouldn't anticipate that there are significant um, in, any, in any way. What about um, the time spent with um, the council archivist? Um, I think you mentioned in your reports, gentlemen, that you'd gone back through 70 years worth of um, titles. Is that something that was done with the council archivist or was that? Uh, through the chair, certainly I did liaise through the, uh, the archives team to obtain all 
all vinyl records um, pertaining to history. Fortunately, a substantive amount had already been collated as part of the development assessment process through CAP. So through the planning officer, they had already sought a substantial amount of the files. So that was really not associated with this activity, but just through the, the CAP process. Um, but I did separately go through to archives um, to ensure that all files um, had been um, looked at and captured where available, just as abundance of caution. Okay, yeah. Look, I might, uh, I'd be really interested to get a bit of a breakdown on um, staff time that's been um, allocated to this project. I guess using the metric that's often provided for calculating motions, which I think are um, about four hours um, for just a simple lodging of a motion, I would assume that this um, project has taken considerable time. Um, so I would be interested to get a bit of a, um, a breakdown. Um, I don't have any questions um, really to um, the legal team other than to just get a sense of what would be the um, consequences for an organisation if they were found not to be compliant with planning law. And obviously that's not, an, not a, um, an issue in this circumstance because your report makes it clear. But if you were dealing with a scenario where people had not been compliant, would they face a fine or would they be required to turn people away? How would that work in practice? Um, through the Chair, uh, in the event that someone is either undertaking development without approval or contrary to an approval or contrary to a condition, um, there are various enforcement options available, not only to a council, but also to third party residents in circumstances where a council decides that a matter is either trivial, doesn't agree with the resident, or, or doesn't think that the resources are, are appropriate. The council could issue an enforcement notice directing compliance if that activity has occurred within the last 12 months. Alternatively, they could take civil proceedings in the environment court and seek orders that that use discontinue or that the use comply with the relevant planning conditions. Equally, uh, a third party, be it a resident or, or any other person, is able to take those proceedings and seek orders against the third party. And unfortunately, we've seen an increasing um, uh, an increasing situation where that occurs, where residents are fighting each other in terms of dis personal disagreements regarding retaining walls or overlooking <coughs> the balconies and whatnot. So, um, enforcement notice, civil proceedings seeking orders from a court, or a criminal prosecution for a breach of the Act. And offences are created for either undertaking development without consent, contrary to an approval, or contrary to a condition. So three enforcement options. Right. So if there had been an adverse finding, then those are the sorts of consequences that could have flowed to a centre that's providing support to homeless people. Okay. And um, look, thank you. That's been um, really helpful for me to understand. I guess. Um, one final uh, question. Is this sort of review um, standard in your experience for local government when a decision has been made by um, a planning committee? Is it standard for these sorts of matters to be looked at again through a review like this? Um, in my experience, it's very important when assessing a development application to ascertain what the starting point is because it's important to understand what the proposed development is for and one can't properly ascertain that if you don't know what the starting point is. So um, we weren't involved in the processing of the application. We only became involved once a decision had been made. Um, but it's important in assessing that application to determine the nature of it, whether it involved a change of use, whether it was for building work or a combination of the two, for the relevant authority and planning staff to make that judgment. Now, reading the report, the planning staff went through the files. Um, thankfully for them, not in as much detail as we have ultimately done, uh, and for the view that the proposal was for building work. So it is common in um, assessing a development application that one ascertains the starting point. Um, a review of this type post event isn't particularly common, but we are instructed on a regular basis to consider enforcement action against a whole range of individuals and activities. And as part of that, we would always, as a first step, need to review 
all of the relevant historical applications applying to a piece of land to ascertain whether the activity in question was in fact unlawful or not. So that would be a starting point. I guess a standalone review such as this isn't common, but the work itself is generally a, a common exercise. I don't know, Nick, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I, I don't need, um, agree exactly with what um, Gavin has stated here. <coughs> I would say it's not usual um, for a council to go outside, so to speak, its own internal expertise um, from its own planning staff and um, its own perhaps retained solicitors. Uh, that's not to say, of course, that it's wrong to do so at all. Um, it's a matter of choice for council, and if there is an issue that um, warrants um, the authority, if you like, of an independent review, then that's a matter for council to decide. Yeah, but it's not something that would happen every day. No, it's self evident. No, I can imagine not. No. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Members? Thank you, Chair. Um, good Dr. Mineta. Um, just at the uh, what could perhaps be said to be the crux of the advice uh, regarding the test uh, for the essential nature of the existing existing, existing use and the, and the precedent that's cited. I'm just wondering whether um, the precedent you found uh, in general, uh, whether it ever encompasses or deals uh, with uh, a potential change of use when there's been a fundamental change or when, when there's been a change in the size of the operation. Uh, so whereas in this instance, uh, I believe you found the situation here doesn't warrant uh, finding a change of use given the precedent, uh, but I'm just wondering when you when you did explore the precedent, was was it was there any situation uh, covered where there was a finding of change of use uh, concomitant or uh, dependent on uh, a change in the size of the operation, or was that just a blanket? Uh, not just doesn't happen basically. Um, if if I just confine myself to say commercial operations, if if there is a commercial operation uh, and it simply ex it expands then there'll be no change of use in that commercial operation. Um, so if we're looking at the no change in character, if you have a minor or domestic activity that is suddenly elevated into something different, a commercial activity, then that's when you may get a change of use from intensification. Um, so, But that's really because there's been a change, if you like, in the character from non-commercial, say, to commercial is the most obvious example. But in this circumstance, uh, the public welfare aspect has remained the same. So um, an intensification, if you like, of demand um, will not result in a change in use. I hope that's yeah. very helpful. Thank you. Members, otherwise I might just ask a couple of questions. Um, nice. So thank you, Dr. Manetta, and thank you, Mr. Layden. Um, uh, there are just a couple of things that I just want um, clarity on. I, Probably we'll just go through the report in, in order as it's presented for the most part. Um, so just at 19, um, uh, section 19, uh, you wrote about wider activities taking place, and this is going back to uh, 1977, um, that it was in your opinion that there were wider activities taking place. Um, what, what were those, as in over and above what their specific approval was, what were those activities that you, um, in your opinion, were taking place? Um, when you say over and above, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. There was no, certainly nothing unauthorised. Mm. But the no, I'm not, not suggesting there, there was, but you just mentioned that there are wider activities um, other than, I think it was a provision of I certainly think um, a clear distinction I hope uh, would come forward is that there is that the centre has really never operated simply as a food distribution centre, which I think is one clear sort of activity or, or use of the land. That it has always had um, other activities associated with it. Um, in the review of the applications, has shown us at paragraph 19 that the, the purposes uh, were, and this is going back to 1977 or thereabout actually providing some sort of shelter for homeless people so they can come in and simply be there or not reside there, I emphasise, but actually stay there during the day. There would be a dining facility, a workspace and community room to get with ancillary facilities. And then I, I found the description in 1980 
um, where they would be the, the use of their site has been described in the way that I've set out in paragraph 19. So that's really already, and that's a long time ago, of course, that's 43 years ago. No, and that's and that's what that's why I was asking. I was just curious where, where yes. it was. But you, you determined it from the purpose, looking at looking at it in those are certainly the nominated purposes in the planning documents. Yeah, yeah yes, yeah. But there wasn't there wasn't anything that you found that suggested it was being used for this or that. In, in addition to in addition to providing food services and shelter for for the elderly. Well, um, there's a workspace in a community room, and unfortunately, the documentation doesn't really tell me too much about what was actually happening there. Yeah. So you you just read into the inclusion of those those at the site that there were other wider activities i think was the language used so well certainly wider than food preparation certainly yeah. distribution yes that's yeah the case. yeah but there's no there's no um uh there's nothing to suggest that that we know or you could know what those activities specifically were well if you go back to 1994 for example where the next site the former doctor's surgery was acquired the activities there are set out um, in paragraph 31 and then paragraph, um, well, it's really paragraph 31. Um, so you've got a chapel 24. and 24. Um, yes, at 24, thank you, Gavin. Um, you've got services being provided by the Royal District Nursing Society, podiatry services, counselling, recreation facilities, and so on. And then it, and you've got a TV lounge or resources room, a pool room, counselling room, quiet room, a dedicated women's room, two further lounges and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've repeated that effectively at um, 31. So we do know yeah, that. So it's a lot more prescriptive in 1994. And was that, was that, was that a change of land use or was that merely a formalisation of, of, of the the specific types of services okay. on offer there. In 1994, the application was a new application relating to the new premises that had been acquired, the most southerly premises, beyond the three And, and only that premises. Yes, at yeah. that point. Um, so that in 1994, the most southerly part of the site had been acquired for the first time and there was a change of use at that point in relation to that part of the land right. because it hadn't been owned before by the Daughters of Charity. Yeah, or used for that. Used for that. No, been used as yeah. a doctor's surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, understood. Um, and so, and so, when we're looking at when we're looking at that DA in 1994, obviously at 32, you note that there were no planning conditions governing the operation of the new development um, uh, imposed by council. Um, and I just want to I want to consider that, um, and I understand throughout the the, the, the course of it. Um, you were provided with some documents that we have um, at council. Um, and I just want to read an excerpt of a letter from, um, and I just want to give this for context for members. Uh, 15th of April, 1994, from Mr. B. Moylan, the chairperson, then chairperson of the Hart Street Centre, and Sister Veronica um, Shinnick. And um, this excerpt of that letter says that these proposals will upgrade substantially our existing services for those currently attending. And it is not envisaged that this development will cater for increased numbers. Um, I understand from reading your report um, that it was what was it, 40, 40 um, uh, for breakfast and 90 for lunch or similar figures to that. Um, so noting that in, 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 in 1994, there were no conditions placed on it. Even so, the Hutt Street Centre specifically said throughout the course of making the development applications that there was no envisaged increased usage. Um, uh, the, the, the fact that there were no conditions placed on it doesn't, it, may, it basically means that at no point after the fact can one read into it that even though they represented that there wouldn't be an increased usage, even though over the ensuing 26 years there was an increased usage, probably about fivefold, um, you can't then go back and and say oh we're going to keep it at that or what have you is that that's that's how i read it is that um, what i would say about that is that as i do recall at least partly reading that letter that letter i would take as a statement of the intention of the daughters of charity that it was not their intention to expand their operation um, and if in hindsight now with 26 years history there has been some not expansion, but an increase in demand 
through for all sorts of social reasons. And I think probably the demand has gone up and down. I don't think that's necessarily consistent with that statement of intention. Mm -hmm. It's just that it has worked out differently, if that's the case, on the ground. Um, so, so the condition to the, and I think, and I think Gavin's point is a good one, that really it's up to the governing body or the council to, to just, impose the conditions. Well, yeah. just to anticipate what might happen socially. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I certainly remember reading that the Daughters of Charity have taken the view that they wish to offer a service, but in no sense encourage it because their aim is to alleviate Naturally, um, yeah, uh, and not not yeah. somehow they're not a, a shop. They don't they don't um, get it's not not in their interest, so to speak, to have more and more people there. Um, but they are interested, in course, given their charitable foundation, to to seek to meet need, which is imposed upon them, if you like, externally through. And society. and so drawing drawing on your drawing on your your, your knowledge of planning law um, and reading 32, I, I'm I'm assuming the implication is that council at the time in 1994 could have, if it so chose, put conditions on capacity at that point in time, at least yes. for that at least for that premises that was the consideration of the application. Yes. Yes. So they could. But they obviously opted not to. Um, okay, understood. And so, and so, is it is it correct in 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 reading that so if if um, uh, forty is okay then two hundred is okay now. Um, so, could the Hunt Street Centre conceivably it could it can increase its patronage as much as or its patronage could increase um, to say five hundred a day or possibly even more than that, and that would not be outside of that would not be outside of their land use and they would be legally not only would they be illegally able to do that but the council actually couldn't go back and put any regulation or conditions on on that even if they were having say 500 or a thousand people a day visiting the not saying that's desirable of course yeah. but hy hypothetically just to give us an idea because obviously this is a failing of being able to con of council considering the future possibilities. So I just want to have it clear in my mind for the benefit of other members. It's not always the case that um, bodies impose conditions. Sometimes the premises themselves will operate, if you like, as a, in a natural way as an upper limit. Um, so these premises, I, I haven't visited them, of course, I haven't seen them, but I assume there must be some sort of natural limit to the numbers. There will be also a limit, I assume, um, given the way the centre operates to the numbers that the centre itself proposes to it to receive, uh, even if it is operating, as I'm sure it is, um, to render whatever assistance it can, I think the centre would probably say a point, look, we can't take in vast numbers. And don't, don't, mm. we can't sit 1,000 people down in a room, for example, I can't just Yeah, of course, not, not at the same time, it's obviously the corner of who comes through the door of course of the day so so but but if so let's say naturally they could accommodate that um, in the room so they would be able to have 500 people a day uh, if, according if to the planning law there is there is no planning restriction on the intent that would allow them uh, would allow the council to intervene on the basis of a change of use of land resulting from intensification whether or not the occupation of a particular Building would give rise to health and safety. Not safety, but, or, or but I'm not dealing with that. No, I haven't. Uh, but certainly, yeah. from the point of view of change of use, no, there is no yeah. nothing arising from intensification would would stop that. Typical. I mean, could I just add another observation yeah, just sure. on that topic? Um, there is a recent case authority in relation to a traditional service station down at Holfast Bay. It was a nine to five service station. Um, the council. Um, went to court when the administration and management of that service station went to a 24-hour service station. Supreme Court ultimately said, yes, it's busier, yes, there's more activity, but it was a service station before a petrol filling station. It's still a petrol filling station. Mm -hmm. There were no conditions on the hours of operation. So it's a consequence, yes, a significant potential increase of intensity. And when people are coming at 3 a.m. in the morning to, to, to buy their petrol and bag of chips, but not a change of use mm. in the absence of conditions restricting that historical service station, which you wouldn't expect because it's been in place for many, many years. So that's perhaps just another example of yeah. a, a yeah. change that, that's not necessarily controllable in today's term by and, modern town planning. And so in, in that instance, there were conditions placed on the hours Correct. of operation. Okay. But if there were, then they you could have made it would have them adhere to that. 
yeah. if there were conditions imposed to move beyond those conditions wouldn't be a change of use because it's still a service station, but it would have required planning approval to do so. To alter the conditions. Okay. Um, uh, and just just finally, and look, I, I think generally speaking, it's of a high quality, so I'm not taking issue with the end product so much, but I'm just curious as to, sorry, that, was, that was, wasn't intended to be <laughs> not a compliment or otherwise, but- We appreciate it. No, 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 but I'm just, <laughs> it, it'll make sense in context. Um, uh, just because and I was the one who moved the motion, so when we talk about or when it says in there instructed not to speak, um, I just want to understand who made the determination because when I read completely independent and at arm's length, um, uh, I mean independent as in there's no undue influence, there's no conflict of interest, there's no competing loyalties or priorities. Um, I certainly didn't expect it to be a purely desktop exercise and in fact I would have much rather preferred it had there been at least some degree of interrogation of what the actual, you know, and I would have expected one to go down there and see and understand what the use of, what the actual use of the land was being physically present to do that. Um, so can, was that was that under direction from administration or was that, whose interpretation no, was um, that? I've certainly been down Hutt Street and I've seen the centre um, and insofar as its physical aspects, um, Dr. Mineta had lots of photographs and plans and I explained to him physically what's on site. Um, it wasn't simply a desktop review insofar as we afforded um, all parties the opportunity to come and speak to us. Um, in speaking to council staff, um, in terms of considering that second question, the impact of land use on surrounding businesses, um, that's almost like measuring a piece of string. Um, do we speak to some people? If so, who do we speak to? Do we speak to all of the residents? If so, just in Hutt Street, do we speak to residents in South Terrace? Which businesses do we speak to? So we took on face value, I at its highest, that those complaints were validly made and that what was complained of in fact happened. So we've taken all of that at its highest and also have listened uh, verbally to the people who have reinforced those submissions um, we're given the opportunity to put further material to us. So it certainly hasn't just been a paper review, um, but at some point in time we had to say, we need to complete this work. Yep. So following that hearing, following the submission of further documents, we said, well, everyone's had their opportunity. Um, uh, we'll now proceed to finalise okay. the work. So, And is it is it is it your view, and I, and I, I take it that it's not, but is it your view that if that completely independent part was not in there and you had the and the reviewers, Dr. Manetta, had the ability to go down there and talk with people and engage with them. Do you feel that you may have come to a different outcome or? I very much doubt it. Um, the reality is that if, well, as I understand it, it's important for the council, but also I assume for the community to have faith in the in the report. So they may, they may, any individual may disagree, of course, with what I've written, but at least they won't be saying, well, of course, he, he had one view or another about this because he's been speaking with this person or this person has been in his ear, I'm putting that crudely, but mm -hmm. that, that is what, so at least the council can certainly say um, the, the review has been entirely independent. Now, I, I echo what G uh, Gavin is saying. If I were to begin to speak to anyone privately, privately, was one thing to have everyone in the same room listening to one mm. another the same. If I was to speak to anyone privately, then was I expected to take that information back to someone else and seek a comment and then go back and, and it begins. That, that's a, a one, a very, very different sort of exercise. Mm. Um, but it also puts me in a position, I suppose, of being a fact finder and determiner in circumstances where I didn't really have that authority, so to speak, to start saying, well, I think you're definitely right. In your observations and you're definitely wrong and so on. So I think it I think to take and, and I didn't just assume the complaints were um, were correct. I mean I e evaluated them mm -hmm. uh, and I took them at their highest, that is true, because they seemed to me to be reason correct. reasonably put forward. They weren't they weren't um, vicious or um, over the top or overblown. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there wouldn't have been one or two complaints in all of it where I would have, you know, counselled perhaps more moderation and expression, but overall the complaints were quite reasonable in, in tone. Uh, so 
I certainly accept and plausible. So I accepted that what was being reported was in fact happening and being experienced. Mm. Okay, understood. Um, okay, thank you, Robert. I just saw your hand. Oh up. no, I was yeah. just um, going to um, maybe encourage you to wind up your questioning from the chair, but you've done so. Well, so. Thank you for your encouragement, <laughs> Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, um, uh, I want to thank you uh, for the report. It's entirely satisfactory for me. Thank you. Um, but I had a question of the uh, the administration. Um, the uh, the Legislative Council Select Committee has taken a great interest in what's happening at Hutt Street and is in fact um, uh, through its poverty select committee investigating um, the circumstances and i wondered if there had been a request for a copy of this report or whether it is the administration's intention to supply the select committee with a copy of the report through the chair um, as this report is now public um, it is possible for us to table the report as part of our response to the select committee um, i think that is where is that this week thursday this week um, and i think brett you're going to represent council along with one other staff member so we will be tabling it as part of that process sorry could you tell me more council is appearing before the select committee this thursday that's correct uh, and uh, the council will be canvassed on this uh, report and other matters related to the heart um, we won't be necessarily canvassed on this report because this report wasn't known. Um, we will just be tabling it for information. Yes. The, the content of the, the, uh, the discussion is not yet known for the uh, Brett, if you can explain any further, but I think pretty much that's it. Oh, sorry, Brett, could you also, do you have the terms of reference for that committee as well? Through the chair. The Select Committee on Poverty in South Australia uh, has a broad terms of reference um, and in particular the extent and nature of poverty in South Australia, the impact of poverty on access to health, housing, education, employment, services and other opportunities, the practical measures that could be implemented to address the impacts of poverty, any other relevant matters. So quite broad is the terms of reference in relation to the letter addressed to the CEO. Uh, in relation to an invite um, uh, focus area of the committee as relates to this invite surrounds issues of Hutt Street Centre and related planning questions. Oh, that's quite relevant. Excellent. Thank you. Slightly off topic then, but I think that satisfies everyone. Okay. Oh, oh, Mary? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say thank you for the report um, and I hope the traders, um, I can see that you engage a lot with the traders and I do appreciate that and I appreciate that you put both of the people in the room. I think that's important because I think that that um, in this discussion here today, um, we haven't talked about that, the impact on what the traders have been feeling and judging by your report is gone back from 1994. Um, so it uh, has been an ongoing issue for them for a very long time. So I do appreciate that the inclusion that you did give to them. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Um, I will actually um, add my thanks. I have um, spoken with uh, Dr. Manetta and, um, and Gavin Layton a little bit early when we were preparing this report coming into Council. Um, I particularly thank you for giving the opportunity for both parties to come and speak to you directly and present their cases and that you have taken them at the highest value in terms of um, them being able to uh, tell you their version and uh, their opinion and what is happening in that place and that has been taken into account. I think it's also the questions that we've been able to ask you tonight clearly demonstrate that uh, that um, goes really back to 94 where there are no conditions and that they are their activities are in keeping with the um, the use of the premises. Um, so I thank you for the report. I think that will uh, clear a lot of matters up for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I just want to remind members that that was, that was one of 18 in five 
this will be part five of the agenda, and then there are two more in section seven. So it was an important one for us to flesh out. Slide two, QF finance report. Members, any questions? Excellent. Five, three. <laughs> It was a very good report. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can we just actually thank them for the detail in the report and uh, for that we actually do feel that we are being kept up to date with what is happening financially with our council. Um, hate to see that our forecasted operating deficit has increased, as has our borrowings. Um, but we're still within our prudential limits, which is good to see, yeah, yeah. and uh, that we're keeping on delivering our strategic priorities. So thanks to the team and uh, Deputy CEO for bringing them. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And I think that the lack of clarification that's required by Council is really goes to show that the presentation of the figures in there is um, is a lot better. So yeah. um, thank you. We'll go on to. Um, Five three chair of the core committees, um, and I just just want to highlight to members, despite the fact I'm named in here, I had no knowledge of this before the agenda came out. Um, and in actual fact, I'll be asking some of my own questions as to where it originated, um, and uh, and why. But um, I'll open it up to the floor in the first instance. Members, Councillor Sims. Thanks. Um, Chair, I'm just keen to understand, I notice there's a reference to an honorarium um, being uh, proposed here for um, payment of uh, the chair. My understanding is that was um, abolished as part of um, the uh, reforms of standing orders, part of a streamlining initiative um, or something like that of uh, Councillor Abiad, and that was abolished to try and save Funds. So I'm just wondering why that's being put back. Just for, in clar case. for clarity, Councillor Sims, I don't think, and I'll stand to be correct, I don't think it was ever abolished. It was merely that whenever the Deputy Lord Mayor is chairing a meeting, they will not take the remuneration for it. And the standing orders also made the Deputy Lord Mayor the chair of every meeting. So it wasn't abolished, but it was defunct. But Rudy, if you, is that a correct read of it? Through the chair, so indeed, um, the remuneration tribunal sets the allowances and they provide for uh, an increased allowance for chairs, excluding for the Deputy Lord Mayor who already receives a higher allowance regardless. Lord Mayor. Um, so, so in terms of the mystery of this report, this was a conversation that I had with the CEO. I also hadn't seen the report before it was published on the agenda. Um, in terms of we're coming up to 12 months and it might be a good time for us to review what the last 12 months have been in terms of rotating uh, the committee chair. My view is that it's um, uh, that it is a good opportunity for members to have a turn in terms of being a committee chair and, and getting to know how to do that. Um, and at, uh, it's actually coming in at the same time as we will look at the Deputy Lord Mayor position. So um, as in keeping with some of the previous discussions that I've had with members, um, it really was that this is a review point as we go to the next year. Um, I think the report says that we wouldn't look to put this into play until next year. So um, uh, the current Deputy Lord Mayor uh, would continue to court, chair the core committees. Um, I think the next one in the rotation would be Councillor Kouros, and then of course that would take us to June and we would appoint the chairs for the next year, which would be the next two periods um, that would come in a normal report. Um, so that is the mystery. I did. Um, I, I missed it. I didn't see that it was coming in, and I actually hadn't seen it for any papers. Okay. Thank you for elucidating me, Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, Robert. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can ask the question of the Lord Mayor if this is her um, proposal. It is um, the uh, intention, um, Lord Mayor, in terms of rotating it, then the people who haven't had an opportunity to chair would be given an opportunity to do so, or will it be rotated 
um, between the same individuals? Uh, through the chair, it would be in the same process where council would appoint the committee chairs. So this would take us through to uh, June next year and then we would appoint the chairs for July 2021 through to June 2022, or possibly actually because we go into caretaker in September 2022. Uh, so there would be a following three chairs, I think. That's the way that we would do it. But it would ultimately, uh, just removing the mark, it would ultimately remain council's decision. In the same way that we've always done that. So yeah. the council decision, correct? Yeah, who and when and what have you. Yeah, so it would be appointed by council. Council. Uh, well, look, I, I just make the point that you wouldn't want to I mean, effectively preclude certain council members from being in the chair just because they've been there uh, prior to that period. Um, that would gain sight in the council. And I think that I don't see that as the. I, I would say the default position is, well, the position of the council um, votes on the chair, on the, on the chair uh, but the encouragement is for rotation. I, look, I'm just a bit puzzled by it. Um, I, I do remember, though, that when it was adopted, um, it was the contention of the then Deputy Lord Mayor that this was a, a budget saving measure um, uh, and it was one that he was pleased to confer on the Council. Um, but um, I, I, I'm just puzzled. Are we saying that we are separating the roles of Deputy Lord Mayor and Chair of Committee? Um, effectively from the end of this year, um, ruling out the possibility that the Deputy Lord Mayor is Chair of Committee, or are we saying that the Chair of Committee, uh, if it is the Deputy Lord Mayor, won't receive any additional remuneration beyond Deputy Lord Mayor? Is that what we're saying? I think that's, and that's the standard convention, yeah. The only thing that's changing is that the Deputy Lord Mayor will no longer be the default Chair of every committee. So, so the Deputy Lord Mayor still may be the Chair of Committee, it's just that when the Deputy Lord Mayor is the Chair of Committee, they, they won't, won't get an additional right. stipend. Okay. That's and, correct. And, and it's my um, understanding that that additional stipend is um, 7000 or thereabouts uh, per annum? No, the, the annual budget for the stipend is 7000 as per the remuneration tribunal. I'm not sure what the actual amount per committee is. Oh, uh, you know, yeah, seven thousand a year. Okay, I understand. And do I understand the Lord Mayor be saying that it is proposed that in the circumstances where the Deputy Lord Mayor um, is not the committee chair, then the committee chair in the new year would be uh, the current deputy chair. Is is that is that what I'm hearing, or have I misunderstood that? No. no. I think we'd I think we'd have to elect both. Yeah, we 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 would. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, just I'm sorry, I'm confused by me too. Councillor Gorris. Sorry, just seeking some clarity. Um, just just to be clear, we're we're talking about completely changing standing orders in the sense that we are appointing a, a chair for one half of the year. So that doesn't preclude the Deputy Lord Mayor being can be nominated to be in the chair next year. Correct. Okay. Any further questions? <laughs> I'll just make a very, very quick comment. Um, uh, obviously, it's it's unusual for a council's name to appear in an actual recommendation um, outside of outside of following an election process. Um, but without indicating which way I intend on voting on this whatsoever, um, if it so happens that I'm not the Deputy Lord Mayor after November, uh, there is no desire for me to continue chairing the committee. I just want to um, say that. We'll wait and see what happens at the next, at the next meeting. But I just wanted to flag that um, at the outset without indicating my voting intentions. So, be therefore, entering the debate. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Alexander Hyde. Um, what we would have to do is if this goes through at in next week's council meeting, we would then vote for the committee chair. Yes. Um, and for those periods. But should that, and this is a question probably for Rudy, should that be done via a procedural and then a ballot? That would be the better way to do it. I think that's what we would okay. All right, good.
Good, good. good Councillor Martin. Uh, can I ask the administration, uh, assuming that both matters uh, come to the November meeting, am I making the right assumption here? Which matter comes first, the election for the Deputy Lord Mayor or the election for the Committee Chair? That's a good question. It depends on the agenda. It hasn't been constructed yet. Yeah. 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 yeah, the recommendations are usually first. Well, um, yeah. Let's not, yeah, let's not get stuck into it now. The, the, me, the meeting at, at the suggestion of whatever can actually resolve to pull things forward or push the back. It's just that, that from what I've heard now, that the, the outcome uh, of either election might be determined by the order. Oh, I don't anticipate that would be the case. Um, we can deal with that in the meeting. There's no point of workshop right now. Um, any further questions? No? Okay, we'll move on to 5 4 City of Adelaide Disability Access and Inclusion Plan 2019 2022 Annual Report. Robert. Thanks, Chair, and um, thanks very much for the uh, work on this. Um, and Christy, we, we've had some um, discussions about this, but I thought I'd put it on uh, the record just so that um, the community knows where things are up to. What's the status of my motion that I moved um, a little while ago around um, setting up a, a fund to make events and activities more disability friendly in the CBD? I mean, obviously, um, we've limited this year in terms of um, the kind of events we've been able to have, but how's that being progressed? Thank you. Through the Chair, uh, in the report at 7.3, we talk specifically about a grant that we have received, together with the Alexandrina and Mount Gambier Councils, for accessible events. So this now gives us some funds to work through exactly your motion on notice, and we will hopefully be able to round that out with you. Um, to this end, which means there will be a minimum of 15 events and um, potentially more that will have improved access for people with disabilities across those areas. So the detail of which will be worked on now. Great, thank you. Members? Okay, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Lisa. We'll move on to 5.5, five, Safer City Action Plan Annual Report. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Members, questions? Councillor Martin? Um, I just wondered if we're at 4.2.1, uh, the figure uh, came from. That is, particularly the figure that says uh, just 24% of people feel less safe at night between 8 pm and 1 am in the city. Um, I know that later on there's a, a report that is quoted. But there doesn't appear to be a source for that one. I just wonder what it was. Yes. The city user profile? Okay. Mm. Through the chair, yes. The city user profile, as referenced above. And, and I just, um, I was surprised, given the crimes against the person at 4.3.1 have fallen, that there is that perception. You know, we, we're actually safer, but pe people feel the same. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought that was a question, not a comment, Councillor no, Martin. I was waiting for a response. I don't know. It was the intonation in your voice. I was listening. Oh, I thought there may have been some explanation of the, you know, the, 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 the sentence finished with the question. Always the same. Were there any other hands up? I didn't see any. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Christy. And we'll see you in a moment, I think. Um, sure, yeah. we could order these in a more convenient fashion. Uh, we'll move on to 5.6, which is the Adelaide Aquatic Centre Future Options Progress Report. And of course, we're going to take this one as read. There will be no preamble. Um, and I'll open the floor to questions. Councillor Martin. Can I just say what a great report this is? Um, uh, it's a good document, I'm happy with this. Um, 
But I do have some questions with regard to the proposed feasibility study. Um, and, and it does seem to be suggesting that um, we will be inquiring into the two sites identified. Um, is there any option to be a bit more open-ended about it, to ask people about the two sites and possibly other sites? Because I, I am getting uh, feedback uh, and I've had only two lots of feedback uh, from people who are concerned about one of those sites. And I just wonder whether we can be a bit less prescriptive in what we ask. For you, presiding member, I suppose it would be good to understand what site in particular. Maybe we can answer some, uh, provide a response. But there's nothing to limit council in regards to sites. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to hone down to a site for us to undertake a feasibility. Otherwise, it's a, it's a significant amount of cost to go across all the sites. But if you can identify the site, we're happy to to look at. Oh no! I, look, I'm, I I understand, and I'm happy that that too are nominated. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether there's a possibility of going A, B, C, some other site on Park Two, um, in the uh, the spirit of being open-ended about the, the questions that we ask. Three percent member, uh, I'm in council's hands. Certainly, that that could be looked at. We just need to look at what that does to the feasibility, both from a timing and a cost perspective. Okay, fine. Um, and Chair, um, there's no mention of a, uh, a diving facility, and I know we've had that discussion. Um, but my understanding of um, a sport such as competitive water polo is that they prefer a deeper pool, a, a diving pool effect. Um, are they to be accommodated within the depth of the pools that's proposed, or are we not accommodating them at all? Through you, presiding member, that, that's something that we will come back in regards to the feasibility. However, um, having spoken to both the Department of Recreation and Sport and the South Australian Sports Institute, really what they believe is it would be adequate to look at a, a training facility or a pool which would allow for uh, what uh, local competition, but naturally they've actually pumped a lot of money into Marion. That's where they will prefer uh, water polo. Um, from a diving perspective, dive pools, uh, the diving community is very small in numbers and to accommodate a dive pool you're talking about a pool of substantial volume of water five meters deep with significant cost for very low return. It would be our recommendation that we actually wouldn't look at diving but we certainly could entertain the uh, water pool. Um, and, and will that be canvassed in the feasibility study and particularly the, the public consultation part? Through you, presiding member, the first thing we would be looking at feasibility is naturally to look at site, to look at how we can accommodate, but also how we can fit the services, and that would talk to that as well. Okay. And have we been approached by diving organisations or water polo? Uh, through you, presiding member, we've been approached by all areas of the community in regards to aquatics and uh, dry activities. Um, if we were trying to accommodate everyone, we'd actually be in the state aquatic centre business again, probably bigger. Um, what we're trying to do is at least match where possible Council's original intention and the guiding principles, which was to serve the existing community, noting that the diving facilities haven't operated at that facility for a long time and it's since relocated down to Marion. Okay, so because the facilities that are there are not operated, we're excluding them from our future plan on that basis. Three presiding member, again coming back to my comment, diving is a very low participant sport and the cost would put significant burden both on the repairs and council in regards to actually building a diving facility for those amount of participants. Okay, um, and, and a distinction you raised with which um, uh, I just asked for some clarity uh, from through the chair. Um, we're talking about a re regional facility, not a state aquatic centre. What is the difference in your mind or the administration's general? Who's paying for it? <laughs> through, through you, uh, presiding member, f first and foremost is that when you look at the standard of, which is provided in the state aquatic centre in regards to training facilities, uh, there, there I say competition ready pools, timing equipment, all of the testing areas, 
uh, marshalling and whatever. We're not talking about that. We're talking uh, basically community leisure, but can accommodate, dare I say, 50 meter outdoor pool, 25 meter indoor pool, warm aquatics, hypertherapy, so on and so forth. So it can certainly accommodate uh, elite sporting groups, but it's not set up naturally to do elite sports. However, in saying that, if you had a 50 meter outdoor pool, um, you could do an overlay and competitions could be held because it's 50 meters. And would that, uh, what's contemplated, um, allow, for example, major competitions, say, uh, uh, Commonwealth Games? Through your presiding member, Commonwealth Games has uh, very strict guidelines in regards to the facilities that matches FINA uh, guidelines. They are come with significant cost. However, if you were look, to look at the Gold Coast and to look at Perth, what they've done effectively is they've done an overlay of their outdoor pools. And what I mean by overlay is they put staging around. So for all intents and purposes for the TV, it looked it, pretty special in regards to it. The conditions would be is it would have to be, meet the requirements in regards to the scale and then naturally after that if it was in regards to a competition ready pool you'd have to go into timing and stuff like that. We don't believe we would need to purchase that. That would probably come with a competition type facility or they would bring it in. So uh, um, what's being proposed could ultimately be used with additional expenditure for major competitive events such as Commonwealth Games, if necessary. In, in theory, yes, for an outdoor 50 metre pool, in principle, yes, but it would be subject to council making that decision to move because there is certain things that we need to adjust. But we'll bring that back in feasibility. Oh, well, uh, that would be good, uh, not least because I am aware that one of the impediments to the Commonwealth Games being staged at that late. Um, it previously has been the absence of a seating capacity at Marion and therefore um, in order to at some stage attract something, uh, an event of that standard, um, we would need to be able to have the flexibility to accommodate. Thank you. And one final question. Uh, the table at 57, um, those um, uh, projects can be run concurrently? That's all right. Some of them can be run concurrently or are that through the chair, correct. Yeah, so um, initially we're sort of flagging that the top three there are trying to be run in unison where we can. There's obviously some opportunity to try and lay those over a lot of projects. You could find examples that are quite linear, some where options are sort of overlaid to try and speed the process up. But towards the back end of that table, when you get into design, procurement, your head construction, that's very linear in nature. The initial stages that we're in at the moment are able to be overlaid to speed that project up. And, and from go to work, um, best and worst, uh, uh, and I know it's dependent on funding, but I mean, in all, in the best of worlds, um, with the money available, go to work would be um, the addition of those values that are linear in that table all stacked on top of each other. So you're looking at the probably from project initiation through to commissioning and fit out in a linear nation sort of fashion. It's one of those would probably be the best. I could give you a list. Okay. Yeah, if we, sorry, if we could get those, I have the same question. If we could get that, I don't want to have to make a GAN chart to work it out. If, we, if you could give us that best case scenario, assuming the money's there. That would be really helpful. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, through your presiding member, it's an easy uh, comment to actually put in. It's, it's a two and a half year build in regards to an aquatic centre. So if funding was available, it's two and a half years. If you've nominated your services, site, whatever, it's two and a half year build. Uh, is that after the business case? Or that, that effectively, once we go through this process with the feasibility, if council determines that we have the funding or the funding is sourced, then the reality is it would be a two and a half year build. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Good report. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to? No. No. Thank you. All right. We'll go on to five seven Golden Model Park Community Land uh, Management Plan, and uh, of course, this has been through committee before, so. Um, if we could just make an update, I guess, we'll only focus on the points of clarity required. Thank you, hello again, members. This report includes the Golden Wattle Park Community Land Management Plan and a building concept. 
As you know, the Community Land Management Plan sits within the Parkland Management Strategy and will guide decisions on the range of amenities and services in Park 21 West, including the proposed new community sports building. With relation to the proposed new building, at its meeting on August 28, 2018, from three options presented, Council endorsed a two-level building with a ground footprint of 465 square metres. Based on this endorsement, architects have created the draft, and the draft building concept design that you'll see in attachment C. Our objective with supplying you with this information is to inform you of the design intent. The intent is consistent with the Adelaide Parkland, um, Parkland's building design guidelines and has been to Apple. At the last council meeting, uh, there was also a bit of discussion about the difference between building footprint and floor plan. So if I could clarify, the footprint being the entire surface area and the floor plan being the room surfaces at area not taking into account walls, the actual width of the walls and overhang. Therefore, there can be discrepancy between the two uh, sizes. This has now been clarified in the Adelaide Parklands Building Design Guideline and footprint is the measure which we will use in relation to this and all future building design. Any final design for this sports building brought to council will, will comply with the 2018 decision to have a ground footprint that is no greater than 465 square metres. Happy to take questions. Thanks, Christy. I think that should clear it up for everyone, but Councillor Martin. Thank you, look, that's good. So, um, just so I make sure I've got it right, but we parroted it back to you. Footprint does not include walls. Um, uh, uh, footprint does, floor plan does not. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And look, I, I am still uh, confused um, and wondering about the differences in the um, plans on pages 121 and 122. The, the building footprint. Uh, according to 121 is 465 square metres but the, um, the total building floor areas are 895 square metres <coughs> in map 122. I just, I just can't make that work. Can you help me with that? Mm -hmm. Through the chair that will include the upstairs area. And that's the combined total? The final design that will come to council will show a footprint on the ground of 465 square metres. The combined total is recorded as that. So it's um, 465 square metres on the ground and 465 square metres above. Through the chair? Uh, no, that's not correct. So that figure is separate for the upstairs area. So the footprint is on the ground 465 square metres, and above, it's 895 square metres. Yep, through the chair, on the, yes, on that plan it is. So what's above overhangs by almost double the footprint below. Yes. So it would be like um, a big footprint, but the footprint is actually a veranda. So the footprint really, um, depending on how you looked at the building, if you look down from above, the footprint would be 895 square metres. Yeah, if you were in a helicopter or in a drone. Yeah, through the chair, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, no, that, that I understand it now. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, there's nothing further. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Ray. We'll go on to 5 8, a permit fee model review. Thanks, Vanessa. Members, questions? Take a look at it. Um, I, I, I have a question. Vanessa. Um, uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at permit number or sort of category um, zero triple eight yeah. road and footpath occupation works. Um, 
And then there's another the one immediately below it, road with the occupation worms. What's what's the difference between those two sorts of permits? Because I mean, look, from the information we've been given, they're exactly the same, but for a four hundred and fifty dollar difference. So what's the is it the nature of the work? Is it what they're doing? Is it who you're charging or? Um, through you. I assume you're referring to attachment B, which is our old fees. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I want to understand. So, can you, sorry, can you please repeat which two you are so asking me to? So, it's 0 triple A and 0 Yes, which is road and footpath works. Yes, road, they're both called road and footpath works. Yes, yeah, so one is, one is per annum and, one is... and one is per week. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, that was the confusion. And so then on the on the new model, what do they come in at then? What's the per per square meter on that? So under the new model, um, there's two types of city works fees. One would one is for hoarding, um, and one is just for general city works. So they're all per meter. Yeah. Yeah. So the the hoarding ones would come under hoarding. Which is the ones you were referring to in the old. So zero okay, Sorry, what's mocked me up is the per annum versus per week. That's what, yeah, yeah. That's what did it. That, so that, that did... makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, very good. Members? Was that a hand off? No, no sorry, I'm just scratching no. my face. You're right. I won't go to an auction. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I'll just make a tiny, tiny quick comment. Um, Oh, actually, no, it's okay. It's right. It's all right. I'm just going to comment on outdoor dining, but I think the message has been garnered over time, so it's all good. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Vanessa. So we'll move on to five nine investigation of subsidy program for retail and hospitality businesses. I think that was distributed separately to members. And we'll take this one as red and just open it up for questions. Members? Yes, my darling. Um, so uh, the, the thought process in regards to bringing this through is creating a circular economy that for the city. Um, we also, um, and, and to support the businesses um, and to have services going directly to them. And uh, according to your recommendation, um, you're uh, saying that um, uh, that uh, this initiative um, is not cost is not a cost effective option option to support small and medium businesses in the city in North Adelaide. I guess um, I guess I'm I'm kind of thinking well what else do we have in place in order to direct more traffic directly to businesses because we did have promotion for the businesses ticket validation for the youth park and that hasn't come into effect yet. Um, how other ways, if you're not recommending this option and you don't think it's cost effective, um, are we going to be able to um, you know, drive more traffic to the to the our city? Um, so through the chair, um, I suppose it's, there's two matters. I think um, the first part of that is that when we looked at my my Darwin and we understood. Um, from them, their own evaluation was that the subsidies they're providing to consumers actually, you know, in 61% of um, cases, wasn't actually increasing the spend. So they just weren't spending more, they were just using the voucher right. and they weren't undertaking any additional spend. So it wasn't really delivering um, value in terms of the money that the City of Council, the City of Darwin was putting into that um, approach. So what, um, I suppose, what the, the two sectors that have been really impacted in the City of Adelaide and, and more broadly across Australia um, are really around accommodation and food services, 
probably no surprise there. Um, and then also the arts and recreation services. Mm -hmm. So the, the areas that we have um, looked at and provided support for in those have been around the outdoor activation grants where we've really seen significant uptake. And the, the idea around that is um, you know, improving outdoor areas where perhaps they can spread out more broadly, um, provide outdoor seating so they're still complying with the physical distancing requirements put in place by the Department of Health, um, as also providing more attractive, you know, facades and streetscapes as well. So that's one, one way um, that we think has been a really good and effective way of providing financial support. Um, the 80% the um, to 20% contributions, so 80% towards the cost of that works compared to the business of spending 20% has really provided a really good stimulus and significant uptake. Um, and we're just starting to see those projects be delivered. So um, when we actually see them on the ground, we'll actually, I think, have some more traffic coming into those areas. Um, the other the other ways really around festivals um, and events and, and sponsorship, so you've seen that there's been some cancellations of some large events, but we actually have been really working hand in hand with a number of um, events that are continuing to provide um, additional support for them if, say, they need perhaps bigger spaces or they need to put in place additional facilities um, and you know, structures and that type of thing. So we've had that additional grant uh, the quick response grant that council um, endorsed some time ago um, and we've had a number of um, applications for that already so um, uh, so uh, what's it called the graze and what we used to be cheese fest i can't think what it's called at the moment um is, is a current one for that so the next, the next gathering graves oh, i think yeah, it's called right. yeah, sorry so, so they're, they're the ways we're really trying to target the most impacted sectors of our community, business community. I, I take all that on board and, and, I, and you know, I, I agree that, that the stimulus in regards to the businesses in hospitality um, probably have, and the events that we have, services for the food, food side of things, but the idea of the My Darwin, I would have thought would be more for retail. Um, in like clothing, shoes, and all of that, which have also suffered um, as well during this impact. Um, I um, just concerned that the there is no foot traffic into the stores, and there, you know, with, which in turn would allow more economic benefit for people coming into the city overall, um, and being the online to create some sort of platform that brings people in um, and being able to buy and then do other things rather than sitting behind and buying. Yeah, so um, through the chair, it was probably remiss of me not to mention the success of um, the Rundle um, Management Authorities. Um, I think what it's called, Win It All campaign, where they really um, have driven quite a significant increase in spend. So normally an average spend of a consumer in Rundawall is $98. By, by um, holding this um, uh, campaign over a couple of months, they've increased that to just under $300 dollars per spend so and that's been with a contribution obviously through the levy not not other means um, of only um, you know twenty eight thousand dollars you know compared to you know millions of dollars so it's really driving that activity so probably they're the types um, of incentives um, that are, are going to be more cost effective than a my darling uh, I guess with the chair what I was meaning is that I mean I understand Rundle had that competition, but my concern is more for the main streets, um, driving traffic there. Um, I know that the Rundle Mall have their own set up and bringing people into the mall, but my concern is more for Gouda Street, Hart Street, McConnell Street, Melbourne Street, where you've got a small time operator that doesn't have the ability to do the um, large platform of um, app facility to bring people into the store like the larger companies that are in London more are able to do. And I would have thought that this would be more centered to that small time business person to be able to latch onto uh, the ability 
to have people come into their store. So I wasn't looking at it creating an impact for Rundle Mall. I was looking at it for the, to create an impact for the overall the city. Um, in, yeah, I know, but that's what I was looking at. So I just would, you know, if we're looking at other things that we're doing um, to simulate for the area, the nice in the main streets as well. Yeah, so through the chair, um, I, I suppose the response to that is if we're having something that is more um, broadly applicable to the whole city that really looks at a more cost effective mechanism. So you could have that type of approach that really drives change and increased spend by the consumer rather than um, basically just giving a consumer some money that they're going to spend anyway. So there's no benefit for the business. So I just kind of said a couple of quick comments through the chair yes. back on. You, you can once this conversation stops. No, you can. Thank, thank you, back through the chair. Just a couple of quick things to add. The, the observation around the anchor activation grants is really interesting because I think at the time we were concerned that the private sector wouldn't be looking to, to invest and it's actually proven to be the opposite. We, as we know, we opened it up and I think within 48 hours on the first tranche and then sort of about six days on the second tranche goes to show that the private sector, particularly in hospitality um, and retail, wanted to co-invest with us. So I think that's been a fantastic outcome um, for council because it's actually leveraged private sector money. And the second one would be the $4 million of um, hospitality vouchers that the SA South Australian Tourism Commission put out where there was a $100 rebate for a hotel in the city and a $50 rebate um, if you were staying in a regional area. And my understanding, talking to the SATC, is that again that sold out in about a week. And in fact, they're probably delaying. You had to use the voucher by about the 16th of December, and I think they're pushing that out because hotels haven't been able to cope with the demand. That's been really helpful for the city um, because I think a lot of regional people now have gone, well, $100 to come and stay in a new hotel in the city is quite aspirational, $100 off. So $180 night for a you know, spa and champagne arrival is now only $80. So that's creating extra discretionary spend for people to spend in retail, in malls, and to be more dispersed throughout the city rather than just the mall. So that was announced um, post my Darwin. So um, again, my understanding of that has been incredibly successful and the hotels which have been in desperate need um, have got some really solid bookings out of that and continue to look at secondary spend into um, other parts of the, the precincts around the hotels. So, sorry, I'll come to you, Francis, following on from that, Ian, so, but, so the, the, the hotel, that, the, whether it's the Great State voucher, is that good? So the Great State voucher has been a success, though, it, it appears, if they've already, if they're already Yeah, subscribed. and one of the reasons for that, I think, is it's a pent-up demand for travel, because you cannot travel outbound and you couldn't travel even interstate into places like Melbourne, or even if you do, you had to quarantine. So there's, you've got this incredible amount of people who still want to travel. Yeah. Um, so it's a slightly different psyche, but the fact that they are then spending um, for hotels, they're also wanting to spend in destination. So it's been actually very helpful for the CBD because it's $100 into the city um, and a few, so the price differential also helps. So the couple of things in there that are driving it, I suspect. Um, and just before we get too far away from the topic of spend, um, Michelle, at 10 in the report, it talks about the survey undertaken by City of Darwin found that 61% of consumers using the My Darwin program did not increase the value of their planned expenditure. Um, out of the remaining 39%, do you know how much they spent it, as, as an increase? How much sorry, they spent through, through what they Sorry, through the chair. I, I actually don't have that hand to hand, but I can find that information provide and provide it to the Before council. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That would be great. Thank you. Franz. You know, the comment uh, that I'm making is it's over the, the two uh, business support type, uh, motion or uh, proposals here. And so if, if our intention with these proposals is to get more people into the city, have, uh, have you, uh, um, in, a, in the course of trying to uh, see what, what, what works uh, in that area of trying to attract people, have you f have around other you know, jurisdictions, have you found any activities or any promotions or anything like that that has you know delivered uh, um, you know an increased value? I mean, like the the hundred dollars is, is a way. Um, uh, you know, so I'm talking more about rather than trying to give people money. I'm talking about are there things that other people have done? Uh, you know, in your research around the world uh, that will deliver that that we can target those secondaries because any dollar we spend as a as a, as a I mean, any dollar, dollar we spend. Uh, will most likely go to the major retail uh, areas first. 
So if we want to help those in the secondary areas, how can we do that? What what uh, what sort of things have worked in other in other areas that we can sort of target? Um, you know, and, and sort of the, the level of spend, etc. I mean, these competitions is work, and the Rundle Authority is a great example of that, and they've done very well. And they did get 450 locations to you know to take part. So through them all, so they all were active, and uh, I mean, the, the, the twenty-eight thousand dollars is certainly amazing value, and they did the engagement was the entire precinct. So how can is there something that you've seen, or is there ideas that you have floated with the organisation that you know could activate a particular streets uh, that are more in trouble that we you know that we can deliver them some help um, in a cost-effective way? Um, so through the chair there. There was a number of points there, so perhaps I'll speak first to other jurisdictions. So we have looked at other jurisdictions, but when you look internationally, actually we're in a very lucky situation here because we don't have, um, you know, the significant amount of community trans transmission. You've got, you know, a lot of European cities on their third wave, so we actually are able to be providing. Um, support where um, if you look in the US and Europe, that really is not the case. So that we're well ahead of the curve, I suppose. Um, we've got 85% um, of uh, foot traffic back um, compared to being 80% down in April. So we're on the right trajectory, but it means there's less places to look, look, you know, in terms of who are the leaders and what are they doing. Um, so, and Victoria obviously is not a place to, to look. Um, and when we've had other states, um, such as uh, Western Australia and Tasmania in particular, with border closed down, so they're just looking at their own economy as well. Um, what we have seen is most of the um, work is around uh, marketing and, and you know, bringing people, locals back to engage. So we will continue to look at what else is happening. There hasn't been anything that's really jumped out at us um, to, to go, well, that's a good idea, let's do that, but we keep looking um, at those. Um, I think probably just the other thing, adding on the back of what um, Ian has said, is of course the My Staycation work that we did where we actually went out to all of our hospitality um, and tourism providers as well in the city and got them to bundle up packages um, and offering those as well. So we've had um, an increase in, in the order of 46,000 um, in the city as a result of that and an additional 220 bed nights. So we still will continue to look, um, but I can't say there is a, an example that I know of someone who's doing it better that we should be following. Sorry, through the chair, if I'm just at that, I did speak at a local government small business roundtable last week, it was John Chapman and pulled together, and there were a number of other councils speaking, um, smaller councils like Victor Harbour, Prospect, um, Martin Hazy spoke on behalf of Business SA. And when we sort of talked through the, the, the raft of things that we've done in totality compared to individual projects, but in totality, the $11.4 million that's in there, and, and the range of things that have been um, signed off by this council. Um, the feedback was incredibly positive from both John Chapman, the Small Business Commissioner, as well as from other jurisdictions to say how much the City of Adelaide and, and you as elected members have achieved. So uh, look, there'll always be the odd thing here and there that you go, well, wouldn't that be great? Well, I think the Rundle Moor one is a fantastic idea and, and wouldn't it be great to see that being a bit more citywide? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would have thought that sort of stuff would be in train in the future. Um, I think to Michelle's point too, we, we are a little bit mindful here of um, our fiscal advice back to you. Um, clearly the decisions that you will make, but we're trying to be pretty fiscally responsible about if there is a second wave, for example, um, how would we be able to stimulate again? So we just, we, we're just mindful of unknowns as well as knowns, if that makes some sense. Members. Okay. Nothing. Thank you, Michelle. We will move on to 510 business assistance. Also circulated separately. Over to you, members of the hands. Questions? Ooh, what was it? Oh, Councillor Marble, sorry, I missed you. Sorry, I'm starting to feel weary to be speaking to God so long. Um, well, guys, I just felt that. I just wanted to. Um, the, the administration is recommending against 
Um, and they've listed a series of disadvantages, um, the main one of which is uh, council's um, financial position. Um, but I wonder, um, and this is a serious question, I mean, have they considered the possibility of reputational damage for those businesses who aren't uh, going to receive any assistance? And I mean those who are paying $10,200 a year rates or whatever. Uh, or alternatively, uh, businesses which employ um, not one to three, but 21 people. Um, uh, and uh, additionally, was any thought given to particular sections or the impact on particular sections of the economy, uh, which have been hard hit, like say hospitality, where the rates are considerably more than $10,000 generally, the staff numbers are probably well under, but they, they will receive no assistance at all. Is that likely to lead to reputational damage as well? Has that been considered? Um, through the chair, uh, I, I don't think it's accurate to say they've received no assistance at all when you look at the significant, you know, billions of dollars that have been pumped in through both the Commonwealth, there's been a lot of money pumped in through the state, and I think for a relatively small council of 200 million, you know, we're putting in 11.4 into stim stimulus. If you compare that to something like Brisbane City Council, and I'm only going off the report I saw they did recently, they're a $5 billion council, like they're bigger than the GSP of Tasmania, and they were putting in about 7.5 million into some of their small business recovery. So, you know, it's, it's a bit hard to sort of weigh up it's not a competition about who's invested the most. I think it's about where, where is the wisest, waste, wisest place to invest. Reputationally, um, Councillor, look, I think Adelaide's got an excellent reputation um, during COVID. hope it remains that way. Um, I think we're all feeling for businesses. I, I totally understand that. We totally do. We talked to Josh Baker next door. We talked to Cranzos. We talked to how they're going. The, bits that they're, the feedback we're getting from them is invest in bits of those infrastructure because they want to leverage it. They clearly want foot traffic, but there are some health um, issues around major events. I think everyone understands that, you know, December through March next year is going to be a very different quarter to the normal first quarter of the year. Um, but they're also innovating, they're setting up using new spaces, they're spreading out, they're doing different shifts. Um, you know, double bookings obviously has become a very common thing now where you get a booking at 12 o'clock till 2 and then 2 till you know, 4 or something. So they're trying to maximise turnover in a, in a restaurant. So I think that, to be honest, the private sector does adapt very quickly to those types of things and the consumer is as well. Be my comment. But there's, I think there, is, there has been plenty of money in the system more broadly than, than just um, what a, a council can do. Okay, look, I, I, I'm not going to criticise the overall support of the council as well. All I'm suggesting is that, you know, for example, I can think of a hotel uh, in North Adelaide, um, which is paying 30,000 plus in rates, has less than 20 people on staff, um, uh, which um, would receive uh, nothing. And yet the hairdressing salon four doors down would. Um, and therefore, it seems to me that uh, both of those businesses have been doing it tough um, because of COVID, but only one of them is going to have our support. I just, I just wonder whether their their, um, their attitudes to council, uh, because of the way that the money has been distributed, uh, um, whether we need to think about broadening the, the criteria. Um, yeah. Through the chair, thanks for the question. I think that's exactly what we've got the sort of rates hardship provisions where we do take a case-by-case -case basis. And if I think there's a very good understanding in, in the organisation um, here in our rates and finance team of the particular sectors that are doing it tougher and the hospitality, obviously, sorry, accommodation being that, that one specifically in arts and events is probably the other one. Um, so those provisions are available 24-7. So um, I think I probably know who you're talking about, but um, an approach with them to discuss um, deferral or, or ways of um, repayments around rates would certainly be of assistance to them rather than the 30 grand they might be normally paying. Sorry, just through the chair, just to add to that, um, one of the reasons we limited it to the employee numbers was because council's decision was small to medium-sized businesses. So we we had we had a discussion about that previously with council. So we used the ABS um, data in, in relation to what that constitutes 
constitutes, which is that number of employees. And just one uh, final question. Um, in respect to the staff numbers, um, are we talking about an historical number? That is to say something that existed before this scheme started, or are we talking about the current number? Um, and, and the reason I raise it is because, I mean, clearly someone with 22 employees has a great incentive, um, you know, to make sure that the books say they've got 20 on, on a particular day. So is it historical? Sorry, through the chair, that's actually a really good question. And, and these are some of the difficulties of implementing schemes like this, where there's going to be have some sort of judgment call around pre, during, and post COVID to staffing them. And then, to be honest, there's about four or five different definitions of small business to be at that are out there. I think we grab one that was off the, um, the ATO and sorry, ABS, sorry, my apologies. Um, I'd have to look at that in a bit more detail, Councillor, to look at that flex that you described. It's a good point. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, also, just a, a quick clarification. Where we talk about 1 to 20 employees, are we talking about FTEs or body count? Uh, that, that's a very basic sort of... Sorry, through the Chair. I think this is the point yeah. that, um, that Ian has made. I actually don't know what the ABS definition is, so... Uh, Oh, yeah. Just I'll go through. Just we'll have to come back to you on a couple of those things. Yeah. Another really good question is a lot of casualisation in that of the workforce in that sector. Um, so it's something we'd have to have a bit clear definition on, which will I'm sure create some interesting issues in itself. Okay, I might like just ask a couple of questions. Um, thank you for providing all the information. Um, look, I just wanted to get some. Uh, clarity when we're looking at table one at 13 um, in the report. Most of that is clear. City um, support package, uh, the breakdown was difficult to find, but because um, these were in the dark days where you know, we had a couple of meetings in the, the hall. Um, so phase one, immediate response, I think that's what the breakdown here is. Um, all tenants and council buildings, 100% rent, rent free for three months. Um, small business operators, that cost us 1.7 million. How many businesses in the city of Adelaide did that benefit? So how many tenants do we have? Every presiding member, uh, we have approximately 320 plus uh, leases and around about 50 licenses. Um, out of that, it's probably easier to count the ones who didn't benefit, and uh, there's probably around about uh, less than 10 who would not have benefited out of that. Um, and I, I just don't want to go into that because it's commercial and confidence, but right. everyone uh, were approached, they would have received that three month uh, rent free period uh, from, I think it was from April through to June. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that was followed by council decision in regards to deferral of 50%. Yeah, so that so that almost two million dollars out of the eleven million dollars that was spent on, I guess three hundred and twenty um, businesses. Um, Adelaide Central Market Authority uh, rent free uh, for three months zero point nine. How many traders are there? Three presiding members, approximately seventy um, included in in with that, um, and there's uh, sixty two within Central Market Arcade. Alright, so we're up to 3 mil and we've got 390 businesses that have benefited. Um, RMMA waiving the marketing levy for three months at a cost of 1 million. How many in the catchment? Three presiding members, approximately 700 retailers of 300 services within the Rundle Mall uh, precinct. Okay, I'm getting better. Okay. <laughs> so that's so the initial package, $4 million and it benefited, uh, let's say, just over a thousand. Um, and then if we keep going down, um, rate relief, freezing rate in the dollar for all rate payers uh, and 10% discretionary rate rebate. Um, just for my benefit, can I please be reminded what the 10% special discretionary rebate is? It's part of our thank you. Sorry I didn't get everyone up. <laughs> Sorry, 
to the chair, the 10% uh, rebate is around the, I believe it's the, the, the valuation increase. Yes, is okay, that that's percent. what it's, yeah, so that's what I thought it was. How many years has that been our policy for? I know you're new to the world, so Good I don't know. question, but um, yeah, it, yeah, for a very long time. Okay, all right. Interesting. Um, uh, and so freezing general rate in the dollar, are we on our seventh year of doing that? Okay, so I just, I'd say in table one, the second line, uh, that's all standing policy. I, I could not in all conscience, and I'm surprised it's in there, attribute that and try and palm that off and say that that is, um, that is some sort of relief to, to City of Adelaide rate payers. Because it's, not, it's been standing policy, um, both of them for seven years and just the 10% one for even further before that. Um, uh, you park, feel free to chime in. I'm, I'm not, I run a pretty loose ship sometimes, but. Um, uh, you park outdoor dining fees um, and charges at 1920 levels. How many, how many people benefited from the U Park Plus scheme? So you presiding member, when we implemented U Park Plus on the 1st of April, um, we were at that stage uh, approaching 90% vacancy in regards to our car park system. This was there to generate uh, bringing workers back into the city. We started with $8 uh, for an all day, which traditionally was $36 in a car park. Mm. Um, our highest at the minute, and we've been recovering pretty well, is $15. We're still nowhere even close to our 1920 figures. Um, and we've been working really well, and we've got around about 17,000 workers registered on the U Park Plus site who um, are using the site, and it's actually a stimulus to bring workers back into the city mm -hmm. and less shopping as well. Mm -hmm. Which I which I think is good, um, uh, and I think if you look at our office, you know, corporate occupancy rates they're much higher than other um, other cities, and so I, I really commend us on using leveraging car parking to bring people into the city and stimulate the economy that's that's really excellent is there have you been able to at all quantify the uptick um, that U Park Plus has brought and I'm conscious that there are other competing multi-level car park providers which had similar rates for a time um, so there was a service there and we run our own business to compete with them but um, how, how Instead of just saying foregone revenue, do you have any other metrics to say that we've helped businesses? You know, do you have any data to back up the statement, basically? Through you, presiding member, we're happy to share data. Actually, our data is also live on our U Park site where you can actually look at our car parks to see their current occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, since U Park Plus has been introduced, where we had car parks which had uh, vacancy management through U Park Plus, our car parks are going full very quickly. And the reason being is they're going full with workers. Um, and the, the main drive in regards to workers filling those car parks is there's still a reluctance of people to take public transport. Um, so they're actually availing of that service. The other things that we've done in regards to Park Plus is we've supported various activities, not yet nighttime, where we've reduced our fees significantly to bring people into for restaurants, for retail, to serve the city. We've also supported any sorts of events that have been running, for example, anything in around uh, Adelaide Oval. We supported the AFL to try to get people to come into the city and linger longer. Our pricing has been very strategic to actually uh, make sure that people either stay in the city or come in and stay in the city. Um, and we're working very closely with hoteliers and we've done a significant deal recently with the, the Hilton because they're very conscious of COVID. 19, where uh, they're actually uh, uh, purchasing validated parking passes of us to, to actually stimulate activity into their hotel. So we're very working very closely with all the market. Okay. Well, it's, it's good to know um, parking and, and automobiles are stimulating economic activity. Um, I, I'd really love if we could be furnished with some indication as to how much. I know, look, I, I, absolutely, we've got the counters and everything. We know how many people are parking, but how does that translate into spend? How is that? How is that benefiting the businesses? I'd love to have some metrics on that. Um, uh, I realise that can be complicated and, and um, almost not impossible, but if we could at least attempt. Yes. So, sure. so sorry, through the chair. In terms of the spend, um, there is a little bit of information um, on the data that we received. Uh, receive 
um, on spend in the city. So if you look at the actual My Darwin one, there is a graph there. Um, and it's very similar to foot traffic. It's, it's actually about, um, uh, I think, 85% um, of yeah. Um, spend compared to last year. Yeah, but it's not that's not necessarily tied to the that, park. That's correct. But that would be challenging to yeah. find that correlation yeah. because the data yeah. sources are different. Yeah, and that's 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 again why I have trouble quantifying it as something that we give businesses, whether it's cash or form or revenue or what have you. But um, outdoor dining fees. Can I just please be reminded when we waived those originally? When we began the new last term, last term. Um, last term through, the, through the JS, that was last term. Um, it was a one-year trial in relation to, um, in association with some updated guidelines around furniture. Um, it had been previously trialled um, during uh, the first iteration of Splash about seven or eight years ago, and that was in relation to yeah. encouraging new um, hospitality businesses to try outdoor dining. Right, okay, good. But it's standing policy, it has been for a number of years. Um, not really. Um, it was fairly, it was trialled on and off, um, and um, it was only um, finalised and recommended as a zero uh, a fee um, earlier in this term of council. Um, and most cities do charge, and it's uh, when we looked at what other cities were doing. Um, we, we were actually so ahead of the game on that. <laughs> Um, okay, but standing policy, so again, I, I struggle um, counting that. Um, uh, fees and charges, 1920, so that in that line there, it's 2.7 mil. What is the component uh, of that 2.7 mil, which is fees and charges at 1920 levels? What was the foregone revenue from fee, freezing fees and charges for this financial year? Um, outdoor dining fees um, used to raise um, around five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I know that one, but I'm not counting that. I, I want to know from measures measures that have happened. What I want to understand Why is you count measures that? because I'm looking at measures that have specifically happened since COVID started. You can't go back and count things to my mind. That's so that's what I have a desire to understand. Measures that have been implemented since COVID started. So outdoor dining isn't one. I sort of understand U Park Plus. Um, but uh, freezing fees and charges is something we did after the pandemic started. So I'm, I'm curious to know what that dollar figure is. It take my notice if you must. Yes, know. I it's think fine. it might be helpful. So if you're looking for pre-COVID, post-COVID analysis, then I think we need to just recut the data. Um, so, uh, you know, something like fees and charges was certainly, my understanding when council members discussed it during the budget build, um, was in reflection um, to the impact of COVID, um, outdoor dining. Um, although um, you might argue that it's now a standard policy, it still sits in our fees and charges as a separate fee. Um, and in relation to that as a benefit um, for use of public space, you know, you could argue that um, because of COVID, we've allowed people to expand that use of public space. And so while there's no fee attached to it, there's certainly a benefit that a hospitality business is mm. certainly um, experiencing. Mm. Which, I, which I understand, but what I'm, what I'm trying to interrogate still is table one, how much are we actually getting? Um, so if, if I could get undertaken to get that figure on what freezing fees and charges has cost us, um, that can factor, factor into the um, consideration. Um, we're looking at the next one, grants, rebates and incentives. So grants, am I correct in surmising that that's the usual grant schemes that we run such as, or is that only, is that only Christmas and outdoor activation? Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's just those two streams, is that correct? Yes, so three, three chair, they are the they are new yep. grants, so okay. the new Christmas one, the outdoor activation, that's correct. Okay, what was the, for the, for the outdoor activation, Grant scheme. What was the original allocation um, provided by the City of Adelaide to that scheme? Was it 300 or was it 375? 300 from the I think. Yeah, so through the chair, um, that uh, original grant from the state government was in response to their interest in what we had done mm -hmm. through our uh, reimagine and recovery. So that's a really great idea. So the heaters mm -hmm. and that type of thing, we'd like to uh, provide something that's a bit more fixed. 
So we worked with them on, on the relationship yep. to that. So they had their initial amount and then we put in, um, I think it's been 800 and all up, 875. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I don't have the original recommendation in front of me, but from memory, there was a warning in that recommendation about, correct me if I'm wrong, the deputy CEO or CEO, um, that recommendation was, was almost almost recommending that we don't provide extra funding because of the risk to councils spending too much money. Is that correct? Do you recall any lines in there? Not off the top of your head. That's right. I'll have to go back to, to that one and look. But so that original the original funding for the outdoor activation program was three hundred thousand dollars provided by the state government. Is that correct? That that funding all was all from the state government in the first instance. So the so through through um, you chair, um, the original funding from the state government didn't come through council. To my knowledge, that was something that we worked on with um, with the state government, and we let council know that we. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm want to know again, looking at the dollars here on the page, who paid for sorry, it? Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, through sorry, the chair. Sorry, can I can I just. Uh, this interrogation has been going on for quite some time. We've got a lot to get through. I do think it's irregular. I'll take it under advisement. Right I do up. think it's irregular for the persistent volume of questions to be coming from the chair. So can I suggest that we start to move things, move through things? I'll take the suggestion on. under advisement. Um, I appreciate it if you would. So, so three hundred thousand dollars, but that but that came from the state government. wasn't wasn't in any council budget line. That's correct. So through through US Chair, one point one five million dollars for outdoor activation grant. Of that, three hundred was the state government, and eight hundred and fifty thousand of that has come from council, and council has endorsed that and approved it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Subsequent, effectively rounds almost. Um, correct. To a degree. Um, uh, Christmas. Um, yes, that was a very good initiative. Uh, events, festivals, and splash activations. Out of that two hundred and ninety-seven thousand, what was the um, quantum which was for splash? Do we have any notes? That's right. Can I? Can I? Yeah. Yeah, we'll take please. that on notice. We haven't any here, but yeah, it's just easier. I think if we take it all on notice, break it down. I've heard you want post-COVID, pre-COVID, effectively um, split between different. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, obviously, you can tell the theme here. Splash initiative was pre-COVID. So I, I, I can't, in all good conscience, go to a business that's struggling and say, oh, look at, look at what we passed last year. Uh, that's, but that's, so that's just on the Splash, we did get um, a grant from the Capital City Committee Office to deliver on that. So the Lord Mayor um, through the Premier, um, secured that on our behalf, so it wasn't necessarily ratepayer money, it was taxpayer money. Okay, I think so that was $200,000 $200, gotcha. from the Premier Cabinet Office. Understood. Um, uh, my Adelaide Staycation, not a more and all, that's great. Um, recover and reimagine, $100,000. Frozen rent increases, um, and this may be a question again for you, Tom, is that uh, it's my understanding that that is a statutory requirement at the moment. Is that correct? We can't put rent up for anyone. Through you, presiding member, one of the initiatives where it's actually council has offered great incentive is that we have not increased our rent. However, once the embargo period, and that's technically what it's called, is removed, council or any entity can increase their rent. We follow the mandatory code, uh, but we've actually went above the mandatory code where we actually waived as opposed to deferred. So uh, we've actually a lot of uh, landlords out there are just uh, deferring and then seeking it back. Yeah, which, which we were not obliged to and, um, and good on us for being a leader um, as a landlord. But frozen rent increase is $77,000. My understanding is we can't put up rent anyway. And that also, as well, that $77,000 is for on revenue at the same time. Is that both of those statements correct? So again, through your presiding member, uh, whilst we can't put rent up as soon as the embargo finishes, we can. However, council's decision was we do not increase our fees or our charges for the period uh, for 2021, and we match our 1920 figure. So effectively, all our tenants are getting last year's rent figure. Oh, okay, so for the entirety of this financial year. That's correct. After the after the end of the correct. statutory. Up until 30 June 21. Right. Okay. Understood. 
Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So again, just to just to sum up, chair. Yeah, sorry. The issue, the I'm issue sorry, is, chair. The, the convention when somebody is chairing a meeting is that they chair the meeting, and you've been asking these questions, I think, for about 15, 20 minutes. You do have a capacity to ask them offline, um, and we've got an awful lot of material to get. Through Thank you, Robert. I'll, I'll, I'll take it under advisement. We'll take it under advisement. Advice. These are matters which I think needed to be thoroughly debunked, and I think if I didn't ask them, other members would be asking them. Um, and well, so I'm not that's going to the, the committee being the chair. The committee, the committee, the committee, the committee is where we get the opportunity to flesh these things out. This is quite a substantial report before us. Um, uh, it's talking about at least three million dollars worth of expenditure, and 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 I'm not going yes, to allow us to rush into a decision like that. Without but exploring. with respect, this is the first organisation I have ever been involved with where the chair asks substantial questions, engages in debate, and moderates their own contributions. Robert, I'm not, to going, the I'm not going to accept that there's any debate here. This is purely an interrogation of the figures, which are black and white and in front of you. And I think we've garnered a lot of information here about those figures. For example, I've garnered that uh, I can only quantify it that around 1,100 businesses have benefited. And around, you know, from the four million dollars that was spent, um, and then a few grants, which is probably another 150. And that's why I've asked for other things to be brought on notice um, to us, um, because you can see in the papers here it's talking about 5,000 odd businesses around. Yeah, the my point is, you are the chair. The role is to moderate the meeting. So can we move on? I'm trying to moderate you, Robert. But well, good luck. <laughs> move on. <laughs> um, I think those are it for my um, questions. However, I would I would like to have before the meeting, if we could please have, um, if possible, uh, an understanding of the cost, if it were to apply to businesses that pay over ten thousand dollars in rates per annum. Is that is that just a, a cut off in a spreadsheet and a tally or? Sorry. Give it a go. Okay. Sorry, through the chat, are you, are you then implying every single um, rate? No, 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 no. I'm just, I just would like to understand if that, if, if all the other eligibility criteria remain the same, um, but just not the $10,000 limit, I'd like to understand where that sits. Um, if, if possible, I would like to understand if you applied the ATO's um, uh, threshold test of a small business, which is $2 million of revenue or less. Um, conversely, I also think I also think that would be easy, um, somewhat to calculate, well, easier to apply for for the business because instead of applying, instead of supplying the pays and go records, they can just give you um, their uh, in, their revenue assessment from the tax office for the previous year. Um, if, again, if that's possible, and just in the eligibility criteria, it talks about one assessment per business. Is is the read on that that um, if there was one business operator, say a restaurateur, and he had two restaurants in the city and paid rates on both of them, but it was the same, you know, Joe Smith Petrietry Limited paying the rates on both of them, would you be suggesting that he can only claim? The cash injection for one of those rateable properties? Or? I, I think uh, the, the original motion talked about business and now we're talking about ratepayers. So I guess just for clarity, is it, um, and I think we've had this discussion before, is it the business that you're looking to support or the ratepayer? Oh, sorry, sorry, and, and you're right, and I, I was conflating the two. Let's say Joe Smith has two restaurants in the city. Can Joe Smith? claim for both of those restaurants or would you would you be reading just because they're separate premises are you saying <coughs> restaurant A and restaurant B are separate Joe Smith may claim two cash injections okay okay understood um, Okay, I think that sums it up. Um, I didn't see any other hands, but were there any, did that prompt any further questions? No. Yeah. From members? Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and Ian, I look forward to getting those um, uh, answers. We'll move on to 511, quarterly forward procurement report Q3 2020 We'll be taking that as read. Are there any comments or questions on that, Councillor Martin? Um, yeah, look, I just wanted to uh, thank the administration, I'm not president, thank the administration uh, for um, providing uh, this to us at committee rather than at council. I appreciate that. Um, I am interested in the um, what page if you want, please. I don't mind. Uh, I think we're on 142. 142. Thank you. Um, I'll, sorry, attach the base one for the transactional, transactional banking arrangements, it, uh, which um, it is proposed that the CEO will um, uh, enter into um, a uh, open tender process for, is our daily banking arrangements currently with the National Australia Bank? Yeah. And are we applying uh, any of um, uh, the notions around um, uh, banks which invest in fossil fuels and the like. Uh, I note that at least two banks in recent times have announced that they will not be dealing in fossil fuels as a means of attracting uh, business enterprises. Is that to be part of our, our uh, criteria in going to tender? Um, through the chair. Um, so this report just talks about the, our intent to go to market. Yep. Um, we haven't developed the full specifications for that at the moment, um, but the current treasury policy doesn't have that element in that treasury policy. Uh, but I do know that there's a motion on notice uh, for next week that talks about that. So should that motion get uh, approved, then we can put it okay. into that. Okay. Yeah. okay. And the physical security, I'm assuming, is uh, security staff at Town Hall and in other places. Is that true? To the chair, right. Thank you. That's correct. Any further questions? Okay, thank you, Sonjoy. We'll go on to 512 proposed event at former bus depot site, 111 117 Franklin Street, Mama Susan's 2020. Members, any questions? <laughs> um, I just have, I just have <laughs> one. Um, obviously, we're approving it. We're approving it for particular times. Are there any circumstances whereby those times would vary without coming back to council? Okay. Uh, through the chair, um, it, it may vary if we received an, a, a request to hold a private or corporate function, which is detailed in the report, um, that may wish to start maybe for example, from two o'clock, mm -hmm. which would be slightly earlier than what the um, 4 p.m. start time would be. Okay, has any preliminary engagement already occurred with Central Market Authority? Uh, through the chair, yes, it has. We've been in uh, communication with them and they have provided um, formal feedback through the public consultation process. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go on to five. UNESCO City, I'm not sure what the acronym is. I still don't understand what the acronym is. Uh, AUCOM Funding and Resourcing uh, 513. Uh, thank you, members. Okay. And, oh, Christy, don't go anywhere. Okay. You're here all night. Um, 514, cultural strategy refresh, members? No. Uh, 515, Tam Prashanta Place partial road closure for Tandania's First Nations Hub 2021. Um, 
I was just giving people a moment to find their place. I noticed there was lots of shuffling, but you could just call out the page numbers with each of them. I haven't heard of it. Uh, page 154. No, it's like oh, it's sorry, sorry. It's 174 for 515. Apologies. Last call. Okay, thank you. Uh, 516 proposed event in the Adelaide Parklands. Groove is in the pod 2020. Members? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, thank you. 517 proposed event in the Adelaide Parklands. Uh, Wonderland Spiegel Tent 2021, High Marsh Square. Members? I just want to say how delighted I am none of these were in North Adelaide. This is sensational. <laughs> Less events in North Adelaide. We can't speak council. No, this event is going to 2 a.m. in North Adelaide. Okay. Um, 518 Resource Recovery, Organics, Recycling and Waste Strategy and Action Plan 2020 to 2028. And I'll just pass over to Ian for a quick. Preamble. Uh, that's okay. 518 resource recovery. It only needs a minute. So. Thank you. <laughs> through the uh, through the chair. Uh, well, this is a, a really thorough piece of work that's been put together by the team with some very extensive consultation out to the community. I think the results speak for themselves, but we took about 85% confidence in, in some of the action plans that have been outlined. Um, I think that speaks volumes for um, the community's um, high expectations around this area, and certainly something we've heard from elected members in a number of workshops and other sessions. So, um, happy for Michelle to touch on the elements of the report, or take any questions, um, but I would commend this piece of work to you. Thank you. Members? Councillor Noll? Uh, yes, I, I do appreciate the report. I mean, I can appreciate how much work is in it. I've been doing a bit myself. Um, as a question, okay, one of the outcomes here is about uh, education that for businesses. Um, you know, how would you envisage uh, you would be doing that as, as part of the process? Um, so, uh, through the chair, uh, there obviously um, is a, you know, a table in terms of our key Absolutely. actions, but um, we are currently in the middle of developing a suite of educational materials. We're working very closely with um, Green Industries SA um, and also with the food, Fight Food Waste CRC to ensure that we have a consistent look and feel. Um, in terms of that material for wherever we are, for our businesses, for our residents, apartments, et cetera, out in the public realm. So that's a really key part of it because wherever um, a consumer goes, whether they're living in, you know, living in the city, they're coming to the city or they're out of business, we want them to understand that the way that they um, deal with the waste is the same. So that's a key plank of it. But then we also have... Um, uh, an approach where we're working with, we will be working with precincts to help assist them with, um, you know, collective challenges that might, they might receive. So, for example, we've recently been working with Coromandel Place, and um, we've had a, a team uh, of. Uh, uh, well, and Dean actually, um, and one of our food health people and also our building people to really assist them to understand what the requirements are, to find spaces within their buildings that are suitable um, and to improve the, the public realm. But it's also going into businesses, helping them understand what the options are in terms of uh, you know which which sort of separation of the materials. So whether, say, if you've got an office building, the types of materials are more likely to be around paper, um, and perhaps some food waste from the office um, uh, office people who are in there. Um, whereas if you've got a cafe and a restaurant, you've got a very different need uh, in terms of you most likely that needing to have 
um, daily or every second day um, removal of organic waste. So it's it's really tailored to the different businesses or will be tailored to the different businesses. And is this also going to enable people to link with obviously providers or a variety of, of different uh, you know, options? So it is about green waste and it's also, uh, but you also have a number of providers that will do that. Is that that will be involved in that as well as in, okay, here is what you need to be doing and here is the people that can provide you the solutions? Uh, or is it specifically just enabling them to understand what the, you know, the waste and that is and how to segregate it better? Um, so it, it will have a, like a number of problems. So if a business's um, waste needs are equivalent to what we provide in terms of curbside, then it's actually looking to uh, helping them to use those services that we provide. If their services are much more significant uh, and, they, and they're not catered for by our services, then it's actually working with them to help assist them to understand what the commercial operations um, that are out there that might be able to service them. It could also be talking to a precinct level. So it might not be really cost effective for one business to focus um, on, on this solution, but if we actually had, um, you know, uh, a number of businesses, say from a precinct um, or, or a street together, then we could find more precinct-based solutions. And just the uh, last one on, on e-waste, what, what's your envisaging with that? Uh, yes, yeah, so through the chair, um, e-waste e is obviously not something that you can use in, that you can put in our curbside services. So it's, it's about providing the very clear understanding of where those drop-off points are. Um, so we don't have any e-waste drop-off points in the city, but there are some close. We are looking at um, providing sort of smaller scale things like batteries and other types of um, uh, a waste in some more readily accessible locations across the city for our residents and, and, and businesses where, it's, um, where that could be provided. Thank you. Members? Good. And Helen. Helen. I just wanted to say thank you for putting this enormous body of work together. I think it's um, the way that you've married up all of the existing policies, embedded it within all of the state work, um, that incredible detail around the matrix I think is fantastic now. I hope you have enough resource to be able to actually enact it and I see we've got the, the budget amount but I think to be able to really work through all of that within the matrix is going to be the biggest challenge but I think the, yeah, the framework that you've developed is incredible so well done on all of that work. Um, yeah, look, I, um, the, the, the sentiments of the report are great. It's sensational. A, a couple of things, though, that I'm uh, not clear about. We've heard conversation talking about a reduction in green collection. We've not proposed that, but you are recommending that during 2022, it is one of the options that is considered by council, and therefore the approval by council of that would open the way to a reduction in service delivery that would still come back to council work? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, for any type of change in service, we would bring that back to council, but we want to really raise that um, as an option with our community, see if it's actually palatable um, or not. It really involves working, um, I think what council, for anyone who's not sure, I think what Councillor Martin was talking about is the possibility of, say, at the moment we have weekly red bin collection, but we have fortnightly green and yellow collection. So in terms of um, the parts of waste that actually um, we're wanting to change behaviour is we've got a lot of what we call addressable waste or vegetative material, food waste, etc. in our red bin, and people want to get rid of that because that smells you know, more than your sort of normal standard rubbish that you put in um, and would go to landfill and you know, couldn't be recycled in your red bin. So it's something that we're um, wanting to look at, whereas that would change that behaviour where that, that material that is actually, um, you know, has odour and, and other challenges could be picked up more regularly to encourage that behaviour um, and you're getting more diversion through your recycling and your organic bin, which of course reduces the the levy, um, and that's something that we would we would like to look at, but we would bring it back to council, and it's something that we really want to talk to adjoining councils 
um, about as well. And uh, the same with the point of connection and settings, and I assume that's the same thing. You don't direct in service or some sort of this, and you get a reduction in rates. Yes. So, so um, through the chair, I think we, we need to work through further in terms of what those um, incentives might be. They come back to come. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in respect of businesses, uh, am I to understand that uh, there is no change in eligibility? Um, if you are a new business, you will not receive red uh, or yellow bin um, as a new business? Sorry, through the chair, like, um, current eligibility includes the full recycle bins. They but don't, not they, the they're not, and, Sorry, um, there's no proposed change to current eligibility in terms of uh, businesses uh, that access uh, curbside service can actually access both a red and a recycled bin. What we're looking at in here is um, the possibility of extending that to an organics bin as well. That was the next question. Yes. But if you're not eligible at the moment, you're not going to be eligible in the future. So, uh, so through the chair, what we are looking at is are there some other precinct banks? Precinct based solutions that might serve a greater number of businesses. Okay, and will the financial uh, incentives work the other way as well? Um, that is to say, if you are in business not receiving a curbside collection but currently paying the same rate in the dollar as a business that is receiving a curbside collection, you get a reduction in rates or you'll just continue to pay even though you don't get the service. So um, through the chair, that's, any, any change to that in terms of incentives or disincentives, we would um, bring back to council for a decision. Okay. And I'm confused about multi-unit um, uh, recommendations. Um, but I know it was, I think it was the Lord Mayor who proposed it, that we should introduce a collection service for multi-storey units. Are you recommending that or are you recommending working with them to refine their waste disposal methods rather than providing them with a, a service? Um, so through the chair, we, we currently do offer a service to multi-unit um, apartments um, and we've been undertaking for some time a transition for those apartments that don't have our service to a bulk bin service. One of the really significant challenges that we see and, and it's addressed in here in part is we provide advice into the development approval process um, and we say you need to provide you know, this type of bin storage area so you can receive a council service. Um, and then through the process we end up, because council's not the authority, we end up often with um, buildings that don't meet our standards. So the, the, you know, those uh, strata corporations can't actually um, physically accommodate our service. So they, they can perhaps have less bins in there, which means they fill up quickly, so they have to have you know, maybe twice or three times a week services. So the, the way we are um, addressing this is providing um, you know, stronger advice um, at that beginning of that process, yep. working with our strata managers who then perhaps get a building and it's not set up. So again, putting signs um, and education materials through them and into our res into the residents in those areas as well. So it's multi-pronged in terms of um, that approach. So any apartment that is actually wanting a council service, we have a process already where we go out and we work with them to try and accommodate that service. The unfortunate things, I think, is sometimes we can't physically provide that service to them because of their um, the infrastructure in the buildings. Do, uh, they don't get a rate reduction for not having that service, do they? Right? That is to say, they pay the same rate for dollar. But that that is correct because yeah, no, that's we okay. could provide it if they were able to. Yeah, um, it's there if you want it. If you want it, sort of, yeah. Um, and just one other thing, uh, radio frequency identification, it, it, that enables, how does that work? I, I couldn't quite grasp. So, um, for example, the, the area I work in, you're, uh, I'm working, sorry, the area I live in, yep. um, we have identification on the bins that we have. It's really clear that this 
this bin belongs to this property. So it's really important for understanding whose bin is being picked up and, and if you've got lost bins, people sometimes can accumulate bins. Um, so that's a really important um, part of it, um, is to track um, how many bins we've got out there, how often we're picking them up. So it's, it provides additional data um, as well, and, and it's pretty standard practice. It's about transparency. Years. Yeah, yes. Transparent bins. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Sorry. And, and would that enable also um, uh, identification of bins that have bad uh, waste disposal habits as well? Uh, so. As part of that education program? So uh, it possibly could in terms of uh, understanding where contaminants have been in place, but we also have currently under our contract the, um, a service where um, Clean Away actually, if they're noticing already that there's contaminants, um, that they provide a notice um, to those, those residents or those businesses. Um, we provide an e-news um, to elected members around that process. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just following on from that, bins have RFID on them. You know who it belongs to. You could, you could, um, uh, with, with your inspectors, look at if there's any contamination in the bin. And for repeat offenders, you could find them. Or uh, potentially, there could be bylaws introduced whereby council would, you know, say that look, you've got too much, you've got too much plastic in your greens bin. So, um, so through you, um, as chair, uh, we already do have a process where um, if our contractors are noticing that we have, um, you know, a low level of um, understanding about what could go in a bin, where we notify them. And that's particularly important for the organics and the recycling collection because that could contaminate the, you know, the entire yeah. um, load. Yeah. So we already have that process. If you had RFID, you would be able to probably It'd automate be it more. Better, quicker. Yeah. 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 Do we find people currently if they contaminate their waste? Uh, so no, we don't um, find people um, for waste um, contamination of those those two streams. Yes, Councillor. Uh, I was just going to say there is a problem. I mean, I, I live in an area where everyone can see bins out of the, the street, and, and uh, people go out after bins have been placed and put inappropriate material in recycling bins uh, and inappropriate material in red bins. It's a really vexed issue. I don't know how you. I think. get the same as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it drives me nuts. I don't know if this addresses that, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, and so, members, sorry, were there any further questions or comments? Um, just want to keep moving quickly. And and thank you, Michelle. I think it's, uh, this work is of a very, very high standard. I just have one, um, one point. OK, let's just say I'm a simple man. And there's lots of words in here. But practically speaking, if I'm a business, if I'm a cafe that wants to reduce my uh, uh, food waste going into general waste. Um, how is how is this sort of precinct idea of greens? How is that going to work for me? What am I practically going to do? So let's. I've just emptied my coffee ex excess, whatever. I've got a bag of it. Where do I go? How does it work? What what is the vision? So um, at the moment, um, if you have that type of waste, you need to go to uh, a private. You know, a, a commercial contractor. We don't offer that they service. They just put it in the bin. So they're most they're likely put it in the bin, unless, say, you're at this Adelaide Central Market. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're looking at is um, in basically offering. We 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 wanting to investigate offering um, organics to, uh, in addition, but understand that it's more likely to be suitable to do that on a precinct mm. scale because you often have those high users that need a service more than once a week, um, say on main streets or where you've got you know, lots of cafes and restaurants. So that's, I mean, the challenges we need to, to look yeah. at are things like well, where would you put it and where would you yeah. store it? Who's going to get and stuck with it? That, that's exactly right. So. Right. But, but the idea would be you've got an, and let's say you've got them within obviously walking distance so staff can then go and dispose of them. So on Rundle Street, for example, there's all those bins behind where sugar is. You might have one there that is accessible for all the businesses along there. 
Yeah, so we, we would look at where what, what would be practical and accessible, but obviously there's an issue in rent in terms of who owns the land. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, other issues in terms of visibility. Yeah. Um, and but the reason for looking at a precinct scale um, solution is, we you know when you have bin night, you have this proliferation. Yeah, space. Of space, bins, so you know, people space. can't walk on curbs. Mm -hmm. So if we don't just want to have more and more and more bins mm -hmm. on the street. We want a solution that um, that actually is addressing those multiple issues in terms of you know resource recovery, but thinking about streetscape and amenity and safety. Yep, understood. Okay, members. All right, thank you. We'll go to item uh, six and uh, exclusion of the public. Uh, I'll seek a move and a second uh, for 7-1 traffic signal maintenance contract extension. Moved by Councillor Kuros, seconded by Arman. Any discussion? No. Councillor Kuros, on that. Put that to the vote, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. I'll seek a mover and a seconder for 7-2, the Stables of Victoria Park leasing matter. Thank you, Arman. Thank you, Simon. Any discussion? Some No. I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, uh, and also, you may have noticed there's a late addition to the agenda. We have a confidential CEO um, uh, update. Uh, so let's say that's 7 3. I'll seek a mover and a seconder for that complimentary CEO update. Thank you, Councillor Kuros. Seconded by Arman. Any discussion? Some done. I put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Uh, that is 